the metabolism of a cow and a gorilla and a rhinoceros and an ox is such that they still run on fat and protein. Why is that? Because they can't break down fiber. No animal can break down fiber, not even termites. It's the microorganisms in their gut that eat the fiber. And as a waste product, they produce saturated fat. And then the bacteria or the protozoa die off and they get absorbed as protein. Gorillas may eat a bunch of green leaves, but what they absorb is fat and protein. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining another live. This is for January 25th in America, 26th in Australia. Um, just had a bit of a, of a delay, had to get some, some technical issues, uh, sorted out and thank you everyone for being patient. It's good to see you all. Thank you very much for coming down. So, um, before we get to the questions, just wanted a, a couple of announcements. I just had a um, fantastic interview with the good Dr. Georgia Ede, who is a psychiatrist and, um, you know, she's been at Harvard. She's been at Smith college. She's been you know, all over. Massachusetts. And um, she wrote a book called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind. And so this is the same idea that um, my former guest, Professor Chris Palmer from Harvard, um, spoke about basically using dietary interventions to fix mental health issues. And so obviously, she's been doing a, just a, amazing work in that field and treating hundreds of patients with this now um, and, and getting clinical trials going, uh, obviously involved in uh, help write up a clinical trial out of France where they had 31 participants that agreed to be in part of this study and they had refractory psychiatric issues where for decades nothing was working. You know, the counseling and medication treatments weren't working. They actually worked with a specific psychiatrist in I think Toulouse and for decades and just didn't get anywhere, didn't get anywhere, didn't get anywhere, put them on a ketogenic diet. Uh, 28 of them were able to stay on the ketogenic diet, you know, keto carnivore diet, very high fat meat based diet with maybe a bit of vegetables and found that the yeah, 28 were able to stick with it past two weeks. Every single one of them improved every single one. And these are people that didn't have any improvement for decades. And all of a sudden, bam, every single one improves. And across the spectrum of psychiatric issues, so major depression, anxiety, bipolar, OCD, schizophrenia. And so the very, very powerful study. Now, apparently, they're involved in uh, randomized controlled trials, seeing this. So very compelling to show that these people responded like that. Obviously, if you randomize them and controlled it, it would be a bit more convincing in that regard. However, it's, it is already quite compelling because you compare this against standard treatment. You, you compare this against themselves because nothing has worked for these people for decades. And yet now this works in a matter of weeks. So they had something like, um, you know, like over a dozen of them had full resolution of their symptoms within a couple of weeks, right? Like three, four weeks. And they had like complete resolution. They've never had, they've never got anywhere with this, but then in a, in a few weeks, just changing their diet get, gets resolution of their symptoms, which is absolutely amazing. So now they're doing randomized controlled trials, which is absolutely fantastic. And exa exactly what you need is exactly what we need. We need to get more of these things out in the literature like that, the things that we're seeing all the time. We're seeing millions of people improve their lives and now we just need to get it official into the literature with RCTs and other studies to show, hey, look, this is a, this is a real thing and this is really important to get people, to get people um, aware of this stuff. I'll also have, and so that will be going out in two weeks. So not this coming Sunday, Monday, but the next following Sunday, Monday. So the 4th, 5th of February. This coming weekend is is going to be a really good episode as well. That's going to be with uh, Dr. Nick Norwitz, who's a Oxford trained PhD, who's in his uh, third year of medical school at Harvard, and has been involved with uh, Dave Feldman and the Lean Mass Hyper Responders uh, research, which is recently published. So I had a number of people with a with an average time on ketogenic diets with markedly 
elevated or markedly high LDL for however much you, if you want to call it high, because I don't. And uh, I think this is physiological. And they found that they had no progression in their atherosclerosis. And in fact, the trend was to go down. And they had one of the top lipidologists in the world, you know, compile this data and help help write it. And he's of the opinion that, you know, if you have high LDL over time, this equals atherosclerosis. And even he said, and he's like, hey, I still believe that. But apparently for this population, that is not the case. So very interesting work coming out of there. So we're talking to him and he had a very interesting study, uh, the N of one crossover study trial uh, that people are talking about now, which is which is the Oreo cookie trial, basically showing the thing that I've been saying for years, which is, you know, why does LDL go up when you when you go in, on a ketogenic diet, carnivore diet? For the same reason that it goes up when you're fasting is because you're running on fat and your body needs to move fat around your body. And LDL is the molecule that transports fat around your body. So it's pretty straightforward. And so they're showing this clinically where this is a metabolic state change. And so his LDL is up. So he's in that lean mass hyper responder phenotype. And so he had very elevated blood sugar or sorry, um, serum cholesterol, LDLC. And then he had that up. He ate a sleeve of Oreo cookies, 12 Oreo cookies. I would have gone with, gone with a double stuff myself. If, you, um, if you're if you going to do something like that horrible for your body, I think you might as well go for the double stuff. That was the only kind of Oreo I ever really liked anyway. And um, so he did just the normal Oreo cookies, which is probably a design flaw in the in the study. Just joking. And, um, and uh, it lowered his, his LDL by like 76%, 78% down from like 400 down to like 111. They went, oh, that, that may be like an outlier. Maybe we just take it in the next two days. And it, and it kept going down. Then he went on high dose statin. So we had a washout period. So his LDL came back up over 400, went on uh, high dose statin and on for six weeks. And it only came down like 36%. And that was actually after four weeks, which so took far longer. So two weeks on the Oreos, four weeks on the statins. And that was the, the nadir at four weeks, it only came down like 36%, something like that. Anyway, not that much, not nearly as much. And then it started actually coming back up by the six week mark. It was higher than at the four week mark. So the reason he picked Oreo cookies, which I thought was hilarious was because obviously, I mean, who the hell in their right mind is going to try to argue that Oreo cookies are good for your heart. I mean, you have to be a madman. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be people that do it and, uh, you know, it's an N of one. So that, that's going to be the first point of attack. But, you know, it, it is it is a demonstration of this metabolic state change. And it's a sort of a, you know, a thumb in the nose to these sorts of people that, um, you know, have have just no have you know, no flexibility in their thought. And they just can't possibly they're just so inside the box, closed minded thinking they're like, nope, this is what it is. Everything's over. You know, and they can't just think, well, maybe these boundaries are wrong. Maybe this box is wrong. Maybe this box isn't the whole universe. You know, I mean, Einstein thought that too. At Einstein's time, they thought the Milky Way was the entirety of the universe. And so they're trying to make a theory of everything that we can sort of explain all this. Well, like, you know, maybe, maybe you could do that with one galaxy if that's the entirety of the universe, which you can't. But when you have hundreds of trillions of galaxies like yeah maybe not so you know when you're not working with all the information you're just you're sort of in that closed box thinking like you're just you're going to get things wrong so it's at least hopefully we'll just sort of wake up some people on that and that will be we'll be discussing all of that and more on this weekend so hopefully people can come out for that premiere and um that'll be at the same time so 9 a.m. Perth time on Monday, which should be 5 p.m. Um, on Sunday in in America. Um, I might play around with that just just because I have uh, some some work stuff that morning. But if if I do, I'll obviously announce that and everything like that. So it might be might be a couple hours before that or one hour before that potentially, like starting at 8 a.m. 4 p.m. Sunday. Anyway, take it, keep an eye out for that. That will be happening this weekend. And um, please, I, you know, I hope to get a, a, a lot of people there for the premiere, because obviously the more people at the premiere commenting and liking and, <laughs> and things like that, 
the mut it does much 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 better with the algorithm and youtube pumps this out to a lot of people so hopefully people can can show up for that so there were a couple super chats that that came in that unfortunately didn't get uh starred stream yard sort of doesn't allow us to to sort of catch things before everything starts but uh, we were able to copy and paste these sorts of things. So I'll just read them out, but I won't be able to put them up. The first one is from JS Designs, who gave a super chat. Thank you very much for that. They say, my uncle was diagnosed with prostate cancer, including his lymph nodes. He eats a, a standard American diet. Are you aware of specific studies on this? Can you talk a bit about this topic so I can share it with him? Well, so if you if you want to go look at um, Professor Ben Bickman, who's a professor of biochemistry, biodynamics, whatever, whatever his exact title is, um, at BYU, he's been studying insulin, insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity and, and the different effects on the metabolism of the different things that we eat and uh, for decades. And he has spoken about prostate issues in his book, why we get sick. And um, so you can, you can find a lot more information there specifically about the prostate, um, specifically about just cancer on its own, all cancer, uh, have damaged mitochondria that we know of. And so prostate cancer is no different to that. And because of that damage to the, to the mitochondria, it, it, it cannot process glucose properly. And so it needs about 400 times the amount of glucose to get the requisite energy, obviously it has higher biological demand as well, metabolic demand as well, because it's you know, rapidly multiplying. So because of the, the inefficiency of its it, of its uh, energy metabolism and its high metabolic demand, it needs a lot of glucose. It's called the Warburg effect. And so if you go on any ketogenic diet, like a carnivore diet, this, this reduces the amount of available energy to the cancer cells. Perfect demonstration of this is a PET scan. It's probably something that your uncle has had. Um, certainly people, I mean, that, that's generally how people know that it's in the lymph nodes or metastasize around their body. They do a PET scan. They give radio labeled glucose as an injection and they see where that goes, right? So that's so that's the, a demonstration of that. So you see like, oh, that's where all that glucose went. That must be a cancer or something like that. There's other places too, like your brain and other parts of your body that it will, it will have high uptake, but cancers will do that too. And so every time you eat sugar, every time you eat carbs, alcohol, it goes, that's what you're doing. Just remember that, put that image in your head of that PET scan with a hot, bright, lot of glucose right there. That's what you're doing. You're feeding that cancer and you're giving it a lot of energy. You're going to make glucose. So that's going to have available energy for that cancer. However, the last thing you want to do is double, triple, quadruple that because then you're just you're just pouring gas on the fire. So take a look at my interview with Professor Thomas Seafried, who's one of the top cancer researchers in the world, and his um, and that and the ketogenic metabolic therapy that he uses uh, to treat cancer in uh, lab animals and clinical trials. There are quite a lot of human trials with ketogenic metabolic therapy uh, showing you know significant improvement some of them are, are, are smaller studies some of them are larger studies so it just depends on the cancer as well and so I would wa watch that watch that with your dad and uh, you know you know then then do what you guys think you need to do but I would if I or a family member had a diagnosis, of uh, cancer that I, I know exactly what I would do is I would try to get my GKI glucose ketone index down below two, down below one with a combination of a very, very, very pure meat and water diet only, high fat and with, in, with periods of fasting if I needed to to get that GKI right down. And then look at other sort of um, treatment modalities that, that may, may help. Like if it's something that's um, glutamine is another fuel source for cancers. And uh, you make glutamine just like you make glucose, but there's ways of limiting this and, and interrupting its metabolism. There's ways of lowering your glucose, things like you know, metformin and other sorts of things that you can talk to your doctor about, uh, but also just fasting, you know, and then periods of refeeding so you're not losing too much weight. It's all in there in the, uh, in the episode and, um, and available on 
different publications that Dr. Seavery and others have put out there. So that's what I would do. And good luck to your dad. I hope he does well uh, with that. And the first, very first thing you should do is just stop eating processed food and sugar and, and uh, refined carbs. That, that, that has to go right away because that is flat out feeding his cancer and making it worse. So question from Joel, super chat from Joel's. Thank you very much for that. Vegan for 24 months, uh, three months carnivore, um, ended up in hospital for 14 days. Some symptoms, low blood sugar, ketones very high, drinking and peeing heaps, acid issues and prolactin levels high. Scared to try again, advice please. Well, it depends on what, what you mean by high ketones. I mean, it, it will be higher than others, certainly. If it's, if it's high up in the type one diabetic range, well then obviously that's, that's different. Um, and did that come down? Is your body making insulin? Is what, what was the diagnosis that you had, um, at the hospital, you know, because your, your, your body just, just switching over to, you know, ketosis shouldn't cause you to go to the hospital. I mean, people go periods of fasting, they go into ketosis. It's not just, you don't have to just eat meat in order to, go into ketosis, you can just fast. And so, you know, billions of people around the world fast every single year for religious or health reasons or other reasons. Um, sometimes because they are forced to due to their situations and their circumstances and poverty. So that I, I couldn't imagine that that is what caused these issues. Um, so I would wonder what, what your doctor had to say about that. Um, you should not get acidosis just from not eating plants. That's not really a thing. Prolactin levels are high, so there could be something going on with your pituitary. Um, I mean, you're in for 14 days. Hopefully they did give you some sort of diagnosis as to this and didn't just blame, you know, you, you tried to switch your diet. Also, you were on carnivore for three months. So you were already, you already had a metabolic state change. So, you know, if there was going to be a problem of you you know, with this, it should have, it should have happened early. You wouldn't have just been able to convert over, which everyone will be able to. That's just, that's just human biology. So I would, I would need some more information on you know, sort of what happened, but I would, I would hope that they would have figured out, you know, what was causing that and what was, what was driving that. But no, I, I don't think that, that the diet was the cause of that at all. Um, it's if you want to just try to fast for a couple of days and see what your body does when you when you switch your metabolism over, you could do that if you're scared of eating meat. But meat doesn't cause those problems. It doesn't cause acidosis. That's one of the funniest things. People say that, that meat is very acidic and you need to be alkaline. First of all, that that whole idea of you need to eat alkaline foods is flat out insane. You need to eat human food. That's what you need to eat. And your body does what it's supposed to do with your alkalinity. Um, so we need to be alkaline. If you're in an alkaline state, then cancer can't grow and all that's stupid as hell. Your body is very slightly alkaline. It, the blood pH is 7.35 to 7.45. And if it goes outside of that range for anybody at any time with cancer or not, you get very sick and then you die if it doesn't get corrected. So this, has, this is very tightly controlled by your body. It has nothing to do with the kind of water you drink or even the food that you eat, um, unless you're really overdoing it, just, just throwing in massive amounts of Tums or something like that. Or, um, you know, now it used to be like, Alkaline water analysis, like hydrogenated water. I haven't looked into that, but more hydrogen equals more acidity. That's what that is. Free um, ionized hydrogen. That is what acid is. You know, that's, 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 you know, H plus that excess H pluses that are going around sticking the sticking to things. Right. So that, that's what an acid is. And so, you know, we're doing alkaline water and now it's apparently acid water. Apparently that's the big thing. Meat is not acidic. There's no acids in meat, you know, except things like arachidonic acid, which is an omega-3 and something that you need for your body and your brain. But but there are no things like citric acid. You know, they say plants are, are alkaline. Like, is that is that why they have acid in the name, like citric acid? And, um, and that's how we know the pH is actually like lemon juice and things like that. You know, or have lower pHs. They're they're not alkaline. They they are truly acidic. Some of these things. Um, meat is not. Meat is not acidic. It's, it's 
you know, it's uh, that's that's sort of a ridiculous thing. But anyway, no, I don't think for a second. I mean, it's not going to cause a prolactin level to go up. It's not going to cause acidity. Um, you know, drinking and peeing heaps that's pretty normal. Um, but ketones being up can also be normal. I mean, if you're a type, if you sort of lost the ability to make insulin, first of all, that one of the main treatments for that uh, for type one diabetes was ketogenic diets. That was sort of the only thing that prolonged people's lives uh, before we had insulin available. And there are uh, a few anecdotal accounts of people that have had early on, you know, that have had uh, type one diabetes hit on, they go on carnivore diets. And some of the people have actually been able to start remaking insulin and bringing back that ability. And they don't have type one diabetes anymore. I just, uh, I just spoke with a patient about this last week and he said that he had a client and he's a you know physical therapist that, he did that. He got diagnosed with type one diabetes. He and his dad went on a carnivore diet, ketogenic diet. And, um, after, you know, like a year or two, he ended up not needing any insulin and his endocrinologist was like, how, how the hell did you do that? Like, what the hell happened? And like, well, you know, we did some research into nutrition, how this affects things. And you know, this is what we did. And, you know, who knows how they're going to respond to that or what they're going to do with it, but they should sit up and take notice. Um, it's in the literature for animal studies that putting putting animals like mice onto a ketogenic diet reverses type one diabetes and type two diabetes, but specifically and impressively with type one diabetes, it, it, it triggers the pancreas to start making insulin again, which is amazing. And so they, they've started human trials for that as well. I believe at least that was suggested in the paper on the, on the preclinical trials, but uh, I don't know of any published data on that yet. Um, but this worked in animals and so potentially can, you know, work, work for humans. But, um, no, I don't think that any of those are, would be attributable to just eating meat, especially on for three months. You were at that point, you're pretty much well adapted to everything. So I, I would, I wouldn't be too worried about, about going back on and look, and you, you try it again and you start getting sick. You can always stop, you know, it's not, it's not, um, something that like, if you, if it, if you don't think it's working for you, it's not something you have to do, but I, I really would doubt that that's going to happen, that this is going to actually cause problems for you. So, um, hopefully you do well and good luck with that. I think, I think if you get back on it, that you'll do, do very well. Uh, super chat from Bailey Russell. Thank you very much. 29 year old with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, 10 months, um, PP and breastfeeding. Um, concern is dumping oxalates and it's affecting my baby through breast milk. Is it safe to switch to carnivore now or wait until I wean the baby? Well, I, well, you know, oxalate dumping and it, first of all, I have no idea, you know, what, um, you know, what, what, can, you know, like, like what oxalates and things like that can cross into the breast milk, you know, ostensibly it could, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows. It's a very good question, but I haven't, I haven't heard that asked before. Maybe um, dropping that by Sally Norton. She's the, the resident expert in oxalates. But no, I think that it's very important to eat eat a carnivore diet as, as early as you can, especially in your child's development, because that is going to change and improve the quality of your breast milk. And that's going to improve the nutrition to your child. And, and you will see them. They will, they will start developing faster once you switch to a carnivore diet, I've seen this many times where people switch to a carnivore diet during breastfeeding and their kids just, just started developing off the charts. So I, I do think that it, it's, it's a great idea. You know, if you think you're having, if you, and it's also going to help your Hashimoto's. I mean, that's really important, especially, you know, you get, you know, that you have enough thyroid hormone while you're breastfeeding. That's a very important time to take care of your thyroid health and just your overall health. So oxalate dumping is, is not, um, you know, like severe oxalate dumping, even according to, to Sally Norton, isn't, isn't something that, that really causes huge damage to people. Um, in, typically, you know, it's something that can happen. She said that most people, even if they have a ton of oxalates stored in their body will have basically a couple bad days or a couple bad weeks, and then it'll get over it. And they'll be fine, but it's just some people will have extremely bad cases. They'll get very, very sick. And what they do is they just have a very low dose oxalate tea, like 50 to 100 milligrams of oxalates 
in the tea per day. And that seems to suppress that. So if you think you're getting those sorts of things, add in a, a bit of low oxalate tea and, um, and, and that should suppress it. That's the idea anyway. But no, I think, I think the benefits to your child are, are it's, it's, it's far more likely to benefit your child than for you to get oxalate dumping at the time and hurt, hurt your child. And you can always just throw in the tea after that. And so, you know, if you're not eating carnivore, you're eating things with oxalates. And so then you have oxalates in your body and you have oxalates in your breast um, milk as well, potentially. If you're going to get, if you're going to oxalate dumping in there, then obviously the oxalates that you eat are, go are going to be able to get in there as well. So I do think that it would be worth that. Obviously you need to, you know, make your own choices there, but you know, you, you, know, you can always, you can always follow that Sally Norton's protocol. If you feel that there's, that there's a problem with oxalates, you can even do it preemptively, just have a bit of oxalate tea and then just carnivore diet after that. I mean, I personally would just go straight carnivore, but you know, there are options there. And I don't think that you're going to hurt your baby by going that. I think you're going to really benefit them. So good luck with that. So Grizzly, uh, thank you for the super chat. Any thoughts on carnivore uh, results regarding Graves' disease? I'm on meds, normal levels, monitoring with endocrinology. Uh, two months into carnivore, great bumping into you the other day. Uh, Wes, so I, I've had a couple patients with Graves' disease come to my clinic. They have all improved. So it's, it is in the anecdotal stage. I haven't seen in the low anecdotal stage. I've, I've seen you know, people and spoken to people online and obviously seen discussions, uh, where it improves. You're already on a carnivore diet. So I, you know, thing is just see how it goes. Um, I would be very strict with any autoimmune issue. You just need to be just as close to pure red meat and water as possible for best results. And so that's what I would do. And, uh, just keep going with it and, and see how it works for you. You're going to get a lot of improvements anyway. You're going to feel a lot better. Hopefully at this point, two months in, you, you do feel a lot better. And see how it goes with your Graves' disease. Also, another good resource uh, are the, the Facebook groups such as um, uh, Zero Carb Health and Zeroing In on Health. They're fantastic. They, and they have this massive resource, which is their, their search criteria. You can just go in there and look up Graves' disease, search for Graves' disease. You'll see conversations going back a decade or more of people having the same questions that you have and you'll see all the answers and people talking about their results on that. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, you're already doing it. And so see how it works for you. If it, if it helps you and it improves your situation, it doesn't really matter what other people's situations are. If it's not doing as well for you as you'd like, you know, maybe you start looking at that, those resources, see what people did to troubleshoot that being just red meat and water, those sorts of things and uh, and see if it helps for you and um, i would expect that it would because i've yet to see an autoimmune issue not respond very well to eliminating all the things that cause autoimmune diseases so super chat from roger charles thank you very much what book or course would you recommend to get started on the on the basics of real nutrition? Uh, what takes into account carnivore findings um, or which takes into account carnivore findings? So I don't know of any real courses at the moment. Um, you know, maybe things like, you know, Professor Tim Noakes um, in South Africa. I mean, I. I I haven't taken his course, but it was obviously, you know, it's, it's like the science about, you know, ketogenic diets and how this works in our body and carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet, should be a ketogenic diet. And so uh, that could be a good place to start. Um, I don't, I, I haven't taken any of these things, so I, I'm, I'm very much self-taught in this. Um, but as far as books are concerned, I mean, you start with the classics. So you go uh, Dr. J.H. Salisbury and his, uh, the relation of alimentation and disease. You read um, Wilhelmer Stefansson's The Fat of the Land. You read uh, Weston A. Price. You read um, oh, Dr. I think it's Walter Volklin. He gastroenterologist wrote a book called The Stone Age Diet in 1975 and, and things like that. And, you know, and then obviously there's more, more contemporary ones like, you know, Dr. Baker's The Carnivore Diet. Um, I haven't, I haven't read Dr. Saladino's, uh, the carnivore code. Um, but he sort of gets more into the, the, uh, plant toxin side of things. 
and um and then i'm i'm writing a book myself but it's not gonna be out for uh maybe a few months or several months you know we'll see how how much time i had to get on onto it but you know that's that's talking about carnivore diet and things like that but it's it's really just arguing that you know making the argument as robust as possible that the so-called chronic diseases we're treating nowadays are not diseases they're they're toxicities and malnutrition toxic buildup of a species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition so namely too many plants that were not biologically designed to eat and can't contend with and uh not enough meat which we're designed for so yeah so you start with those go with the classics anyway they're they're fantastic So super chat from JS. Thank you very much for that. Any tips for keto breath day 24 on carnivore? And my wife says my breath is horrible. Um, lamb, beef, bison, butter, salt, bacon, uh, one half cup of Greek yogurt max. Um, you know, that, that sort of a, that ketone acetone sort of, sort of breath. Um, it's, it's thought that that's for like very high ketones. If I'm, if I'm correct in that. Um, so, you know, as you go, you'll, you, you'll sort of, your body will get more efficient at using ketones. So your, your total ketone level won't be so massively elevated. It'll start coming down. Like then you would have very low ketones. And to the point that people say, well, they're just not in ketosis. And I'm pretty sure they are. They, they only eat meat. You know, and so whether or not they're in ketosis or not really doesn't matter. I mean, they're you, you eat what you're supposed to eat. Your body's going to work the way it's designed to work. And that's really all there is to it. So the point is, whether you're in ketosis or not, you're still only supposed to eat meat. Um, so that's uh, that's my thoughts on that. But, um, you know, of course, they're in ketosis. Their body's making blood sugar. It's making glycogen. It's making ketones. And so you're in that metabolic state where you're mobilizing your fast stores and running on your fast stores. You're not, you're not running on exogenous carbohydrates. And so your insulin is not massively elevated and causing all this sort of ruckus. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so that, that could very well be that your, your ketone levels will just come down. It could be something else going on, but I don't see anything in what you're eating there that you're telling me that, that you should really do that. Maybe brush your teeth a couple more times. I don't know, some Listerine, you know, but maybe that can help. Or, you know, it, uh, it may be, you know, the, yeah, the ketone sort of acetone breath, it's, it's quite uncommon. I, I really don't really see that uh, that often, but that's probably what that's from. If you have, you know, if your ketones levels are just, you know, re really high, you know, it's just something that, you know, people in keto really have tried to do. I don't really worry about it. I just let my body get on with it. But, um, uh, you know, that can just, if that is the case, then that can just settle down on its own. Um, you know, day 24, which is still early days when you get fully keto adapted, it's likely that your ketone level will sort of level down and that will just sort of take care of itself. And so you do the other normal things that you do to, to take care of, uh, <laughs> inconvenient breath. And, um, and then you just sort of wait that other side out of it. Super chat from David or Dave. Thank you very much. Dave one. I'm 22 years old. I have been on PPIs, proton pump inhibitors for over a year yet. Endoscopy shows no gastritis. And now recently, uh, Reglan, I want my life back, but my gut isn't getting better. Can a lion diet reset my stomach? High cholesterol is a worry. Um, so it can, it can certainly address a lot of the problems that people commonly have with their gut and so you know is it going to fix every problem no but uh it fixes a lot of them you know a lot of these problems that we have are a direct consequence of, of eating a species inappropriate diet and so when you go to eating a more appropriate diet then you know then, then that improves dramatically and obviously there are a lot of different things that it can cause this to be an issue. So, you know, it, it just depends on what, what's going on with you precisely. Um, high cholesterol is a worry for a lot of people, but you know, it, it's been, it's been, you know, addressed by myself and others, Dr. Paul Mason, Ken Berry, um, Baker, Saladino, uh, Kilts, 
thousands of, of people online that have had their own sort of stories and saying, hey, my LDL has been massively elevated and, and my atherosclerosis is actually going backwards. I have um, you know, people in my Patreon group that have, have had that exact experience. You know, one gentleman had a complete occlusion of his right carotid artery. And one year later, it was not occluded anymore completely. It had, uh, had still had a lot of blockages, but it was, it it was patent now. And it was, there was blood going through it, whereas the year before, it was not, right? That's not supposed to happen. That's not supposed, it's certainly not supposed to happen eating a high saturated fat diet, right? So, you know, take a look at, at um, you know, the sort of evidence for that. I have a video called The Truth About Cholesterol and Heart Disease. Uh, it, it was just a scapegoat for the sugar companies. That's all there is to it. It's, um, you know, sugar and processed foods, seed oils, those sorts of things. This this is what's causing the disease that we're, we're seeing now and, and heart disease in particular. And that's, um, and, and they wanted to protect their investment. They make about $1.3 trillion a year. Trust me, they have money to throw around to try to, you know, throw the scent off the trail, um, tra you know, send, send people off the trail. And, um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's a historical fact. I mean, that's, that's in the published literature, their own internal memos talking about how, you know, they did this. And so it's not supposition. It's not an accusation. It's just, it's just a fact. That's what happened. So I would watch that. I'd watch, you know, Dr. Paul Mason's uh, work on uh, YouTube videos and lectures on, on um, cholesterol. I'd look at Dave Feldman's and uh, Nick Norwitz's uh, recent publications on lean mass hyper responders. Look at the Oreo cookie trial. Like I said, it's like Oreo cookies will lower your LDL cholesterol more than, um, then, uh, statins will, if you're on a ketogenic diet or, or just fasting, because when you fast, your LDL goes up. When you go on a ketogenic diet, your LDL goes up because it's carbohydrates that are the problem there. That that's the difference there. You stop taking carbohydrates in your body has to make carbohydrates. Your body's running on fat. Now you have to mobilize fat. That's what LDL does. And some people actually have their LDL go down. Generally people that are, that have more, uh, excess body fat some sort of relationship there, which is interesting. So I, I, there's no, there's no direct correlation. There's not even a strong correlation. In fact, a lot of large studies show an inverse correlation between cholesterol and heart disease. And there's no association between saturated fat intake and heart disease. I mean, that, that has been, there's publication after publication in, in massive, massive journals, RCTs, meta-analyses of RCTs um, showing that. So I wouldn't worry about that. Um, and it could absolutely help you. I, I don't know for sure what's causing your uh, stomach issues, but this has helped millions of people around the world with their digestive issues. So uh, maybe someone in the comments or the chats has had similar experiences to you and can can maybe help a bit more with their experience. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this replay of my YouTube live. If you'd like to catch a live version and ask your own questions, please go to the next scheduled one, usually every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right, see you then, and please enjoy the rest of the Q&A. So we'll get to the ones we can, we can actually click on now. So a question from Daniel Morkin. Uh, guessing a medium rare steak is the um, optional thing to be eating or maybe optimal thing to be eating on a carnivore. Uh, ideally one a day and do men and women have different needs on carnivore? No, uh, it's just each individual person is going to have specific demands for protein and fat and the different nutrients that come with them. Um, it doesn't, doesn't matter if you're male or female, everyone's in, in a different place in their life and they need a different amount of nutrients. So, you know, I eat maybe two plus pounds of fatty meat a day. Um, if I'm working out and much more active, it might go up to four or more. And then you have, uh, you know, people like uh, Lady Claire, uh, who was uh, vegan and anorexic and used the veganism to hide her anorexia. And, you know, we just went to places, oh, I'm vegan. No, I can't eat anything here. I'm just not going to eat, you know, so it was, a, it was a good excuse for her to, to not eat. And she got very sick. She had a BMI of, I think, nine at one point. Got sick, just couldn't, her body couldn't even fight off a flu. And she died. She went, I think she went to respiratory failure and, and arrest and uh, was resuscitated after six minutes. And they're like, you you have to start eating things with, with 
meat in it, you know? So she did, but she sort of ate a bit of it for about a year. She said she was surviving, but not alive. She wasn't living. And then after a year, she went on a carnivore diet and just all of a sudden her life came back, her brain came back and she started, she was eating 8,000 calories a day. That's what her body needed. She was extremely deprived. And so she was, she was eating more meat than I was, you know, she's a very slender, too slender person at the time. And, you know, I'm, you know, 240 pounds, you know? And so it's not, um, it's not about male or female. It's about where you are, how much nutrients your body needs. So is one a day enough for me? It seems to be unless I'm, unless I'm working out heavily. So what you need to do is you just listen to your body. There's no things you all, you need this many grams, this many, this, that's, that's not going to apply to a lot of people. You just need to eat enough fatty meat that you get to a point where it doesn't taste good anymore. It will taste good if your body wants it. It will stop tasting good when your body doesn't want it. And so you just keep eating until fatty meat stops tasting good and then you stop. So, um, yeah, so that's all you do. And you try that at least once a day. If you can add in a second time or if your body needs a third time, fine. You know, you do that. So you just listen to your body. You know, if you're an athlete and you're working out a lot, your body's going to need more. And if you're not giving your body requisite nutrition, you're going to lose more weight than you maybe you want to. And you're not going to put on and, uh, you know, put on more muscle mass than you, than you may want to or need to, depending on your goals for, uh, for working out. But, you know, my friend Ron Talbot, who has been on the show a couple of times, you know, NCAA division one, all two time, all American in the decathlon, um, you know, went carnivore and his, his performance just went through the roof. At first he was losing too much weight and we, he just needed to eat more. So we're like, Hey, you just need to find places you can stuff in meals. And so he did that. And then he got, he had the other problem where he was putting on too much muscle. And he was just like, I actually have to like pull back on my workouts and not work out as much because I'm, I'm putting on too much muscle. I'm getting heavier than I want to. And I've got to, you know, run and jump and pole vault and do all these sorts of things. And so he needed to, he needed to keep his, his weight in a certain range and get that, you know, power to uh, weight ratio up. And so it's a pretty interesting, it's a pretty good problem to have, I'd say. So medium rare to rare, whatever you want, whatever your preference is. I like rare, I like it's just seared and then basically raw in the middle. And, um, but whatever you want, you know, we've been cooking meat for 800,000 years. I don't think there's a problem with cooking meat. I think there, you, you, you make some nutrients more bioavailable by cooking. You make some less bioavailable. You make some, you know, not available. You, you cook them out such as, you know, taurine and, and, uh, glutamine, things like that. So I think go, go by preference and how you feel. If you're, for me, I'm just eating less and less cooked meat, you know, raw meat's pretty good actually that's what rare meat tastes like the rare meat in the middle that's what raw meat tastes like it's pretty damn good so that's what i do anyway and you know for this one too you know think about you know ask you ask a question this do the male and females of any species eat different diets no you know you might have a higher demand for food and nutrition at a certain time in your life like pregnancy and breastfeeding uh, for a woman, or if you're severely underweight or something like that, you've come through famine or about a veganism, then, you know, maybe you're going to need more nutrients, but there's no difference between male and female, male and female lions eat gazelle. You know, they all take down a kill. They all eat that same kill. Um, you know, same with male and female elephants, male and female blue whales, male and female condors. I mean, it's just, it's just the same thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be the same for us too. Molly and Neville, thank you very much for the super chat. Strict carnivore for over four months, lost my cycle the last month. What could be the reason, B, please? Well, a lot of people have hormonal disruptions or just hormonal changes, not really disrupting it. It's more balancing out. If you're not eating enough, if you're exercising too much, if your high, stress levels are way too high, if your sleep is crap, those can all affect your cycle as well. If you're eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good and you're doing that every day, then you should be optimizing your health and you know depending on your age at some point people will lose their period even on a carnivore diet but there i i've seen it it's been pretty typical for people to have some sort of 
disruption of their period, which is just a, a, a demonstration that your hormones are sort of changing and rebalancing. Um, and that usually goes back to a very regular schedule or even a more, more regular schedule after about four or five months. So you're sort of at four months. So normally I'd see that initially when people are changing and then they get to the sort of four or five months mark and then it sort of gets back to normal. Um, so hopefully that just, it's just a blip for you, but make sure you're eating enough, make sure you're eating enough fat. Your hormones are made out of cholesterol. Remember you're not taking anything else. There can be other medications and other sorts of things that can get in your body and interrupt them, right? So make sure that, you know, we, we, we change to a carnivore diet and we think that's the only thing that's going to change in our life. And then we don't realize we've added other things in our life or we've taken away other things in our life and that can affect it as well. So always keep that in mind. There's other variables and stress levels and, um, and uh, stress levels and sleep issues. Those can make you lose your, your cycle. Pregnancy can also make you lose your cycle as well. So obviously, you know, you need to you need to sort of think of all the different sorts of options. But if you're just if you're eating enough meat, you're eating enough fat, and you're not not doing anything else, the diet shouldn't make your cycle worse. It, if anything, it should make it better. But there can be sort of a you know a bit of a disruption for a couple of months, and then it generally gets back to normal. So hopefully, that is the case with you. Vince S, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Anthony. I was on carnivore for 70 days, derailed during the holidays for 20 days, but now back on it. Very good. Uh, day 14 um, and the past few days I had hunger, but no appetite. Which one should I prioritize? Um, interesting. I think you, you know, a lot of times early on your, your hunger signals can get a bit disrupted. We get um, carb cravings, sugar cravings, those sorts of things that aren't actually to do with hunger. It's to do with our body and possibly even our microbiome desperately wanting this drug that they that they are used to. So you still just do the same thing. Try eating fatty meat at least once a day and keep eating it until it stops tasting good. So as long as it tastes good, keep eating. And then once it stops tasting good, stop eating. And it's the same thing. And then, and then the sort of signals will sort of get back to normal always. People always have to relearn their hunger signals. They are very different on a carnivore diet. So just make sure that you're, that you're being aware of how, what, what signals your body's giving you say, oh, is this hunger? Is that what my body's telling me? Try eating meat or eggs. If it tastes good, you're hungry, keep eating and uh, should settle down anyway, that um, maybe just, just, you know, just a bit of more of a retransition issue. Um, but uh, yeah, same thing, same principle applies. Try eating at least once a day. If it tastes good, keep eating until it stops tasting good and you should be fine. Nicole Santa Maria, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, question is a 54 year old female, um, recent cancer diagnosis, current chemo radiation soon, uh, cirrhotic liver found during uh, cancer surgery. Can you speak to carnivore benefits in the setting of non-alcoholic fatty liver cirrhosis, uh, 50 pounds overweight and all labs within normal limits. Well, with the normal limits for, for the lab is generally average for the community, you know, for your, your complete blood counts and your renal function and liver function, there's, they're pretty good. Um, some people just, you know, for their kidney function, if uh, urea is elevated, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if your creatinine is normal, but your urea is elevated, that's not kidney dysfunction. That's not your body not being able to clear urea. It's just, it's uh, high for other reasons because it, if the creatinine's low and normal, kidneys are clearing just fine. Um, and you can, you can just make more urea when you're, when you're metabolizing protein for energy, which often doesn't even happen if you're getting enough fat as well. And then your body's using fat as energy and not using proteins energy. You use protein as building blocks and building material, same with fat, but you use it for energy as well. So as far as um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver cirrhosis, this has largely been shown to be a consequence of, of fructose. You eliminate these things out of your body, it goes away, it could be highly refined carbs and seed oils can also play a role. Medications can certainly play a role. Uh, different um, plant toxins can certainly play a role in damaging your liver. So 
non-alcoholic covers everything apart from alcohol. So there's a lot of different things. The main thing is, is you're eliminating out all of them when you go on a carnivore diet and you just, you let your body get on with it. Cirrhosis is scarring. So that is permanent, but that doesn't mean that the whole thing is fibrotic and, and just one big lump of scar tissue. If you have cirrhosis, that means it's, it's pretty advanced. There's a lot of scarring. There's a lot of damage to the liver. So the, you know, it's most important for you now just to get all that stuff out of your system. So your liver, what parts of it are still functioning can get back to normal and get rid of the fatty liver, uh, issues can get rid of the, the other sorts of harm and toxins that are happening to the liver so that the rest of it does not become cirrhotic as well. And so, um, you know, you get fatty liver and then you get cirrhosis, right? So it's fatty liver is, is reversible damage. Cirrhosis is irreversible damage. We have people that have scarring and it, and it softens. You know, I have, I have scars here that were just you know, pretty noticeable from rugby. And now they're, they're very, very uh, subtle now. You know, so scarring isn't going to go away completely, but maybe it just sort of softens it a bit. But you're, if you're, your liver has a high capacity for recovery, so it's... Um, it's uh, still very likely that if you address this now and, you know, go on carnivore, stay on carnivore and the, you know, the chemo and radiation don't further damage your liver, that you can make at least, you know, you, you can make back as much ground as you can and hopefully not have problems with your liver going forward. And, and, and that's my hope as well. You know, same thing is going to, going to help with your weight loss as well. Being on a carnivore diet, a ketogenic diet, um, is going to help potentially with your cancer diagnosis. As I mentioned, please do watch Professor Thomas Seafried's interview on my channel um, and where we talk about this, ketogenic metabolic therapy with cancer diagnosis. Also, not even um, in, that, in that talk that we did. Uh, I don't think it was in that talk, but anyway, there are studies showing that being in ketosis on a ketogenic diet, when you're getting chemo, when you're getting radiation, helps optimize your results with chemo and radiation. So studies published in 2019 and 2020 showing that being on a ketogenic diet improved, it sensitized the cancer cells to chemo and radiation. So it made the ca more cancer cells die and it protected your native healthy cells more as well. So you had less damage to your body and the cancer had more damage to it. And it also helps from an energy state as well, starving out the cancer. So uh, I think that Going on a on a just a high fat meat based carnivore diet is going to is going to improve all of those issues that you just raised. And so, you know, good luck to you. I hope that things go really well. Michael Greco um, has a question here, Doctor Chafee. Is there any reason the Randall cycle is not talked about? I see this is the cause of inflammation, where the cells have two sources of energy and can only use one at a time blocking the other. No, it's, talk, it's talked about um, fairly regularly. You know, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Bart K, Professor Bart K, talks about this, you know, a lot. And he, he, he would be, you know, the expert in it. And, um, you know, he's, he's been teaching this sort of stuff for, you know, 25 years and now and now teaching it on, on you know, YouTube and the internets, as he says. So that I would I would go check that out. I mean, he, he does uh, great work. It's very very interesting. Um, his interview on my channel, uh, we got into the Randall cycle as well. I thought it was fascinating, and um, you know, absolutely explains a lot that's going on in our body and our biochemistry. So uh, yeah, so I, you know, I think that you know, for me, I I really love that stuff. I think it's very interesting. I try to keep things very you know, broad and just speak in general principles, go back to first principles. What are we as a species? What are we supposed to eat? What are all animals supposed to eat? They supposed to eat what they've been eating for millions of years. What have humans been eating for millions of years? You know, let's keep this simple. And, um, and then you, you look at things like the Randall cycle and you see how that fits in. And he's like, yeah, that fits in perfectly. This is actually a very, very good thing. This is, this makes perfect sense in that context. Uh, we're only supposed to eat meat when you only eat meat. The Randall cycle, you know, is, um, you know, it's, it you know, sort of doesn't 
you know, doesn't uh, cause problems. You're not getting all these excess carbohydrates that are sort of screwing up uh, your cells and your, your cellular metabolism. So, no, I think that's, um, that is something that's spoken about. Not as many people know about it. You know, I didn't really know about it uh, until I spoke with Professor K. So that's where I would go. Um, I sort of leave that stuff to, to him because he's, he's the guy who knows the most about it. So check out his channel if you haven't already. Um, and, uh, yeah, and our interview was, was excellent. It was this fantastic interview. Um, you know, I've, I've done two, two interviews. I've had him on my channel twice. Um, and they're, they were both great. The first one we, we had, you know, two, three hours that we were really just really dug into it. So, you know, and we talked about the Randall cycle there as well. Maria Lancaster, thank you very much for the super chat. Oral health and a carnivore diet. I am 43, swollen tongue, deep grooves covering the surface, scalloped tongue around the edges, indicator of other health problems, carnivore fix. Uh, yeah, well, that can be. It can be a sign of nutritional deficiencies. Um, and so, you know, I, don't, I haven't seen your tongue, so I don't know what that lines up with. You know, I'm not the, the, the best at those. I mean, there's the things that we go over in medical school that you know, just hasn't been part of my practice um, in the last decade. So it's not something that, that I see too many of. But yeah, no, that's, that's a well-known thing. You start having these physical changes to your mouth, to your tongue, to your nails. They can, they can mean very specific nutritional deficiencies. And a carnivore diet is not deficient in any nutrients. And so if you're eating a carnivore diet, then you should not have any of these uh, problems, um, or you should at least try. It should at least start filling the gaps. You know, it can take a long time. It can take months and months and months of even eating, you know, a proper human diet, a proper biologically appropriate diet with replete with the nutrients. Uh, it can take months before you catch up. This is why things like liver early on are a great idea. They sort of catch you up. You know, you sort of add those things in now. And start going on a carnivore diet, and and that will hopefully improve. You need to see your doctor, though. You know, if there's something specific, you know, if you're having a health issue, you know, you should see your doctor about that. If it does turn out to be a nutritional deficiency, then yes, a carnivore diet, especially with some liver to help catch you up quicker, would be very helpful. If you have a specific uh, nutritional deficiency that is severe and is causing problems, a targeted supplement in the short term, probably a good idea. If you had extraordinarily low B12, I would get a B12 shot. You know, it is really important to have normal levels of B12. And if you're in the normal range for B12, you're low. I mean, that's I've, I've just never seen a, a, a B12 range anywhere in the world that actually encompasses what I would consider the optimal range for B12. So, you know, if you're sort of middle of the pack for B12, low normal for B12, I'd say you you definitely need more B12. And so um, just just remark on that. And if you're actually low for there, like sweet Jesus, you need some more B12 and you, you really do need to get probably a shot quickly, you know, to help you and you'll, you'll improve your, your symptoms quite rapidly at that point. But again, it can still take time to sort of come up. It'll come up and then it'll sort of drop down and come up and sort of come down. And so you need to keep eating good things, eating liver, eating nutritious meat, getting rid of the anti-nutrients that, that can strip these things out of your body and not let you absorb them. So that is what I would do. Kimberly Marshall, thank you very much for the super chat. I had live screen testing today and awaiting the results, but my labs over the past two years are showing um, creatinine is 1.18 and um, estimated glomerular filtration rate is 59. Should I be concerned about continuing carnivore three weeks in? No, I don't think so. Um, you will be eliminating a lot of things that can damage your kidneys. Do make sure you're getting enough water. Uh, that's a very common things of, of reason that creatinine can start creeping up. Um, but higher protein diets have been shown to actually improve kidney function, not worsen it, which is, um, you know, just a, a myth that needs to die. So many things in, in medicine have just been best guesses at the time. And they've just been, didn't have anything else really competing 
and or maybe someone was famous enough or influential enough that the competing theories really just didn't get much airtime. And it just gets repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. And then it's just like, oh, yeah, no, no, more protein equals harm. And you got to understand how doctors think. If you go through medical school, you are now an expert in health. And so any preconceived notions that you had, even if it was based on nothing now, because you are a doctor, well, I'm the authority. And by gum, that's what it is. And you talk in an authoritative manner. And then when you ask him, it's like, okay, can you, can you show me? The evidence for that can you show me where you're getting that from someone will get quite defensive and and to be like all mad at you i was i was actually talking to um dr georgia eat about this she you know was a you know uh was a, a psychiatrist at harvard and so during that time when she started getting more interested in nutrition she decided to do the nutrition courses in the at the masters of public health <laughs> sort of um uh classes at harvard which are very plant-based people i've, I've known a couple people that have uh, doctors have done their masters in public health at, at Harvard and they came and they all came out vegans. I mean, that's just like, Oh no, 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 this is what it is. And so there's a lot of indoctrination goes on there. And her, one of her professors was just all about, you know, that just kills you causes heart disease and all this sort of stuff. So she just asked him, man, this is, and she's a doctor and she's a, she's a Harvard psychiatrist. Right. So they, they should be colleagues. Right. And so she asked him in his private rooms, uh, in his, um, uh, you know, in his, in his office and uh, just said, Hey, you know, I, I'm really interested in that. Can you show me um, what, like your, like a few of your best uh, studies on, on saturated fat, you know, causing heart disease. I, you know, I'd love to take a look at them. And he got irate and just started chewing her out and wouldn't answer her question. You know, and it's just like, okay. So probably wasn't based on anything legitimate. Right. So, you know, if you have if you have good ideas that are supported by evidence, you know, you'd be happy to to provide that evidence. It's pretty bloody easy. Right. So, you know, that's the thing with a lot, a lot of medicine is just just best guess. And it's just been just repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated so many times. And so higher protein diets like a carnivore diet are going to improve your kidney function generally based on the on the data and i've i've seen this so many times go on to go on to those youtube or those um facebook forums that i mentioned zero carb health zeroing in on health i mean i i used to be very active in them a number of years ago you know four five six years ago and um it just sort of got too busy at this point but um you know they're great and they have i, I saw so many people improving their kidney function you go through the search function there you look at kidney function, all these sorts of, you will see just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of posts, probably thousands at this point where, you know, they talk about this and people kidney function improves. I've seen three people come off dialysis, which is nuts. Um, there's another young man that has kidney failure on dialysis and he's making more urine. And so that's good. So he's, he's putting off having a kidney transplant for a year just to see what carnivore can do for him. He's about six months in doing very well. I mean, he's not off dialysis, but he is making more urine. So that means something is waking up in his kidneys. If they can wake up more and they can get back to a more normal function, then he may not have to go through a kidney transplant. And that would be amazing. But maybe he does still need to. Maybe, I mean, there's such thing as, as damage done, just like with the cirrhotic liver. If you have permanent damage, just can't be overcome completely to get normal function, then, you know, you still have a big problem. But if you're before that level, then, then certainly there's, there's room to improve. So no, I wouldn't uh, be worried about that. In fact, I, I would be very encouraged and I would expect that to get better. Drink enough water. If your CR, if your creatinine is going up, it's because you're not drinking enough water in this context, I would say. So good luck with that. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll do well, but please, I hope that you do. And please let us know how you do. Brandon Schultz, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. I've been trying to stick to carnivore, but struggling with constipation and stomach aches. ER says it's colitis, eating only egg. Is it though? Eating only eggs, uh, 80, 20 ground beef and ribeye. Any advice, please? Yeah, just, just drink 
you eat more fat. If you're if you're getting constipated, as in dry, hard, constipated, rocky, hard stools, you are not eating enough fat by definition. If you're considering constipation, infrequent bowel motions, but they're still soft, that's not constipation. That's just your body absorbing 98% of the meat that you're eating and not 5% of the plants you're eating, 95 coming out the other end. That's what happens with fiber. You cannot absorb it, digest it, or break it down. And so it has to come out. That's not the same with meat. So you'll, you'll absorb pretty much all of it. 80, 20 ground beef is a bit more lean than I would go. Um, and if you are having dry, hard stools, it's definitely too low. So you just increase the fat at a certain point. You will get, eat enough fat that your body cannot absorb it because you have a limited capacity to absorb fat and there's an overflow valve, right? So if you are eating more fat than your body can absorb, it's going to come out. That's what's going to keep your stool soft. If you're eating a lot more fat than your body can absorb, it will come out in liquid form. And so you will get to that point eventually if you keep eating fat. And so obviously you just increase it until you get to a point that it's just nice and soft. And so that's what I would do. Just eat more fat. Moosk, thank you very much for the super chat. How well can our teeth heal? Uh, can cavities heal? It's taught... My understanding is speaking to dentists, not carnivore dentists, but just normal dentists that enamel will not heal, cannot heal. You know, I'll, I'll wait and see at this point, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, that, that is the thought is that they don't heal, but they also said that you can't put on any bone density after 25 and that was wrong. So we'll see. I think that's a great question for, uh, Dr. Kevin Stock and Dr. Stephen Lynn both carnivore uh, or um, uh, yeah, basically carnivore uh, dentists. I don't know if, if Steven is 100% carnivore. He's definitely a big fan of, of meat base and Weston Price and, uh, and Kevin is, is carnivore. I think they're both carnivore, pretty damn close anyway, mm -hmm. uh, if not completely. And um, so uh, I don't, I haven't asked them ever if, if they've ever seen cavities sort of heal on their own. Certainly can change your oral biome so that you don't have the bacteria that are going to cause more cavities. And so it should just keep your, keep your oral health improved and just stop the degradation of your teeth. And so you sort of fix any sort of problems with fillings and this, that, and the other. And that should be pretty stable from a cavities perspective after that. Um, and it will, it will fix gum issues like gingivitis. And so that, uh, you know, reduce inflammation and, and, uh, infection and things like that. So it's, um, it's something that could be very helpful. It's, it's the teaching that enamel can't heal, but potentially, uh, Dr. Lynn and Dr. Stock have seen different and that's, and uh, that would be an interesting question. Next time I speak with them, I will try to remember to ask that question from Tracy Holcamp. How safe is it for pregnant women in third trimester to switch to a carnivore diet? It's very safe. You know, it's just, uh, it's, you know, uh, is it, you know, how, how safe is it to stop eating poison? You know, that's, that's basically a rephrasing of that question because the things that you're eating besides meat can cause harm and they can have toxins in them and they can, you know, pass the placenta and get into your baby. And so, and same with your breast milk. And so I think it's, very safe and in fact uh, very important to do this at at, at very you know, the, the best time to go on a carnivore diet is in the womb the next best time is right now for anybody in any situation basically i'm sure there will be examples where, where maybe uh it's not but the nutrition will always be the best maybe you have your mouth wired shut because you're in an accident and broke your jaw and you just, you can't physically get it in your mouth. But you know, that doesn't mean that the nutrition is suboptimal at that level. Just there's a, there's a physical barrier there. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's not only safe, but, uh, important to go on this. So again, is it safe to stop eating poison in the third trimester? Yes, it absolutely is. It is, is it safe to get optimal nutrition for yourself and your baby in the third trimester? Absolutely. So, um, you know, very fair question. Um, but I think that, uh, yes, it would be, it's, it's going to be a big benefit to you and your, and your child to do that. Thank you for the question. 
Super chat from Rob. Thank you very much. Have parasites ever been a concern to you because of eating so much red meat? No. Nope. Um, you know, especially like, well, so red meat has like no parasites in it in, in Western countries. I mean, if you're, if you're eating wild game, yeah, sure. There's, there's going to be parasites in there. You have an immune system that's specifically set up to deal with parasites. Um, but you know, this is, this is what's, you know, very normal to a uh, normal recommendation to, to cook wild game more than you would, you know, like beef from, from Safeway. Um, the, you know, USDA checked beef and lamb and, and meat is, is, um, you know, uh, like if they, if they have any sort of contamination or parasites or bacteria, they just pull the whole load back. They recall everything uh, as a public safety matter. So, you know, if you're not hearing about that, if you're not hearing about a recall because of some contaminated meat that had parasites or something like that, it's it's pretty, pretty low odds that you're actually going to get something in there. Um, wild game, different story, different countries that don't have the same uh, you know, protocols in place, um, then testing in place, different story, but, um, no, I don't, I don't, I don't have any, any concern about that at all. Um, you know, you might have more of an issue with, you know, raw fish, sashimi sort of thing, but you know, even then, um, it's generally pretty safe to do that. And, you know, they're obviously prepared in, in specific ways to try to, deal with that. And, um, you know, you should get symptoms, you know, you should get the problems with that. If you have a couple of parasites or something like that living in you on you and you have no symptoms, it's not causing any problems, you know, then you're not getting a problem from it. If you are starting getting problems from it, you know, then you, you see your doctor and you get it sorted out generally a day to three days of, uh, you know, these anti parasitics and it's, it's gone. So it's pretty straightforward, but, uh, no, there's uh, I don't, I don't, I don't worry about parasites and things like that. In fact, there are people that have horrific allergies and they purposefully introduce parasites into their system because it's their, the immune system that's supposed to fight parasites that ends up attacking you as a, as a, as an allergy. And so when your body actually starts doing what it's supposed to do, which is attacking parasites, it lays off on the allergy side of things and they feel a lot better with those parasites. So, you know, you have to sort of think about uh, that as well. We are supposed to be exposed to parasites to a certain degree and we're supposed to be able to fight them off too, which, you know, you largely can. And if it gets out of control, you use medicine uh, and the help of your doctor to get, to get over that. Brandon Roach. Thank you for the super chat. doesn't look like something's attached, but maybe further down the, the chain. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Behind. Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks guys. Uh, just the symbol AE. I don't know what letter that is in Russian or something like that. Anyway, thank you for the super chat. I've done 32 liver flushes in the past eight years, three of which were on a carnivore diet. I was hoping this diet would solve my liver and gallbladder congestion, but I'm still removing loads of stones with each flush, any comments on this? Well, if you have a buildup of stones, you have a buildup of stones and it's gonna be, um, and it's gonna be uh, you know, a while before those things get out. But if you're eating enough fat, your body's gonna be expressing this, these stones and this bile, so you're not gonna get more stones um, as long as you're eating enough fat. So it's not just a carnivore diet that does that, it's getting enough fat. Your body makes a, a specific amount of bile every day that gets stored in your gallbladder, and that gets expressed for you to absorb fat. If you're not eating enough fat, it gets stored in the gallbladder and it just stays and stays and every day just adds up and adds up and it gets concentrated because it's a small space. So it has to get concentrated. So physiologically it can go up to 20 times the concentration, right? So maybe some people can concentrate even more, who knows? 
But either way, what does any hyper-concentrated solution do at rest? forms crystals, right? That's what gallstones are. So if you're getting enough fat that you shouldn't be making any new ones, um, it should be the case that you are, that you are, uh, if you're getting rid of these things that you're eventually going to run out of them, you shouldn't make new ones if you're eating enough fat every day. We also have to wonder, you know, what, what these liver flushes are doing, you know, are these things actually pushing out stones or are they themselves you know forming something in our gut that looks like stones when they come out i don't know i haven't done these things i haven't looked too closely into them um but if you get an ultrasound and you have stones on your on your you know, on your gallbladder and you know and that then that's a good sign that you have these things but if you if you get an ultrasound you have no uh, gallstones in your gallbladder and you do this cleanse and little things are coming out, then it's obviously not from your gallbladder that that's happening. But let's say that it is, I have no reason to suspect that it's not, but you know, so, you know, it's just throwing that out there, but you know, let's say that it is, if you are eating enough fat every day, you will not make any more period, right? Because you can't, because there will be no bile in your gallbladder for uh for more to be you know, for more precipitate and crystals to be formed so that's that's the thing just make sure you're eating enough fat jfl thank you very much for the super chat doctor do you think the carnivore diet could possibly reverse degenerative disc disease i am a candidate for a two-level disc replacement but i am not in massive pain um that's a good question i you know you know after you have you know significant damage and degeneration of the disc? Uh, probably not. I mean, it could probably uh, improve the health of the disc, improve the health of your body so that, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> so that it's not causing much of a problem. And if you're not having a problem, if <clears throat> the, the vertebrae are aligned, you don't have a spondylolisthesis <clears throat> and a slip of those vertebrae, it's just, it's just you have these squashed discs or degenerative discs, and you're not in pain. You're not symptomatic. You don't, you don't just need surgery for the sake of it, right? And so um, it could be that you're, you're, you know, you're, that you're symptomatically fine. You don't have any issues, so that that's fine too. Is it going to reheal your disc? Probably not. You know, once you get damaged to the point, there's just sort of desiccated, flattened, and degenerated. You've already caused a lot of damage to that. It could stabilize that. Will it come back? Probably not, but uh, it can certainly improve symptoms. It doesn't sound like you have many symptoms, but you know people can improve their pain. They can improve, you know, a lot of different sorts of things. Sorry, my cat's just doing weird things over there, and um, you know, so it, you know, if you if you don't have symptoms, if you don't have a problem, you don't necessarily need uh disc replacements you don't necessarily need surgery so you know um speaking to dr gary feck he's an orthopedic surgeon he was saying that there was already studies showing that knee degeneration like knee cartilage degeneration has been shown or at least you know some causes of knee degeneration has been shown to be from glycation from high blood sugar that's causing damage to the cartilage and that sort of softens it and breaks it down and you get arthritis. And um, he said that, you know, there, he looked through the literature for disc degeneration and see if this was caused uh, or, in, you know, could be in part caused by um, high glucose levels and glycation. He said he couldn't find anything. People just basically haven't done those studies. So it'd be very interesting to see if that's, um, you know, to run that, that, that trial and see, you know, to collect disc material of just, you know, barring someone having an injury or something like that, where they explode their disc, that's, you know, that's a physical issue. Um, you know, but you can have physical issues on top of disc disease that, that have been glycated, but, you know, so you're taking out the disc material, setting it off, see if it has, you know, these, uh, you know, AGEs, you know, the, the advanced glycation end products and different signs of glycation and damage, you know, potentially. So we don't have those studies yet, um, but maybe hopefully someone will do them. Maybe I'll just have to do the damn thing. Um, but either way, once the, once the damage is done, it, it, 
depending on how far gone it is, probably not going to come back. I had completely desiccated L4.5 and 5S1 discs when I was 20. I got an MRI when I was 20. I didn't have any pain, nerve pain shooting down. It's just back pain. Just my back just bloody hurt all the time. Uh, and then I, I just inadvertently went carnivore after that. No back pain for like seven years, you know. And I also was doing the hang upside down thing. So it was like the, the inversion table. It was hanging upside down. And after you sort of get used to that, um, obviously, you know, if people have specific medical issues that preclude them from doing that, then don't do that. Talk to your doctor. But for me, it really helped. And a combination of going carnivore and I just happened to have that hanging upside down thing at the time. My God was that better and that can sort of de-desiccate they sort of pull things up and pull fluid and nutrients back in there so that could potentially heal it but if it's completely degenerated and, and damaged and flattened and destroyed probably not coming back from that so it depends on on where you're at with that hit uh mixed toe thank you very much for the super chat What's the key to lower body fat to seven or eight percent? If you're stuck at twelve to thirteen percent, is it doing more workouts or eating less? Even if carnivore, I don't think it's eating less. I mean, you can. I mean, people are doing the bodybuilding sort of thing. Um, they would they would eat a very marginally well. Some do like um, um, you know uh, Robert Sykes goes by Keto Savage. Yeah, I had him on my podcast. He talked about this. He does sort of keto carnivore, mostly keto. Um, bodybuilding, you know, dude's jacked, you know, he's a, he's a pro bodybuilder, keto bodybuilder. And he says that it works really well for him. And uh, as he works for himself, and he uh, does for himself and he does for his clients, you know, it's a matter of just sort of eating enough and then just very slowly reducing the intake to sort of really shred down to a really low body fat percentage. And, uh, but you have to do that very carefully. You have to do that very slowly because if you do it too fast or too much, then you'll actually slow your metabolism. And you won't and you won't lose any more fat and you actually put on fat because that's what your metabolism does your metabolism is not stupid it's not just like a one in one out sort of thing there's a lot of inputs that uh, are happening there if your body thinks that you're in a famine and you're not getting enough it's it's gonna hold on to your fat stores and just be it's just gonna less coming in less going out that's all there is to it and then it's gonna want to save it's gonna want to want to you know protect that uh, that that energy resource so you could do that. You run the risk of lowering your metabolism. Then there's people like, um, you know, Richard Smith, a uh, buddy of mine I've done multiple podcasts with. He's the European pro bodybuilding champion. And he got down to like 3%, completely carnivore. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't do all that cutting um, to my understanding. If you're working out more and you're lifting weights and you're doing anaerobic exercise, you're doing sprinting, you're doing weightlifting, Depending on your age and where you're coming from, you should be able to get down to pretty low body fat percentage. When I'm not working out, I hover around 10% body fat. When I am working out, that can drop down to 5-6% very easily. And that's with eating like twice as much as I normally would. So you have to you have to realize too that our bodies have a particular place that they it wants our body fat percentage to be. And so, you know, if you're eating a certain amount if you're eating what your body's telling you to if you're working out it may be that your body just wants you around 12 13 percent you know you can do things to manipulate that you know for like bodybuilding purposes um are they necessarily healthy no not necessarily are they going to be the best thing for your metabolism probably not what i would what i would suggest first and foremost more exercise more weightlifting more sprinting and really try to wear yourself out and that will hopefully bring that down. Try playing a sport, you know, you know, depending on your age and where you are and and your abilities to to, you know, and and, and desire, uh, play rugby, you know, play soccer, do something that's it's high intensity sprinting, you're going around doing things like you're going to get jacked, you know, doing a sport like that where you're just working out like crazy for multiple hours a day and going to the gym and playing games on the weekends. You're just going to get shredded. I mean, when I whenever I was playing uh, Jesus, when I was playing on, when I was on carnivore, I mean, I was just shredded, but even when I wasn't on carnivore, I would get pretty shredded in season. And then I'd get out of shape and put on fat and lose muscle. And I have to fight to get it back again. You know, every time, every time we start playing again, uh, but when I was on carnivore, it was just like that throughout the whole year. So, you know, but either way, you know, 
putting in a lot of hard work will get you a lot of good results. Um, thank you very much, Anthony um, Menchaka, uh, for the very generous super chat. Thank you so much for that. Um, Anthony says, I have been one week on the diet and excited. My father is on blood clot medication, uh, type two diabetes. Could this, could this diet help? Uh, well, hundred percent for the, for the diabetes. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, blood clotting medications that, you know, just, just depends on what's causing that. Um, quite often it's genetic issues. Sometimes it's atrial fibrillation. So your heart's not beating properly so it can build up clots. Um, largely people have to stay on their, their, um, blood thinning medication for whatever reason. Um, I have seen people say that they've improved their atrial fibrillation, but you, you, it's, it's, it's a bit of a gamble just sort of coming off that because even if you, if you don't experience atrial fibrillation and you don't feel it anymore, it's not as symptomatic anymore. It may not actually mean that it's not happening because if it, you have what's called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, where it just every now and then just sort of fibrillates and you could build up this clot. And they said, well, after 48 hours, it's, you know, higher likelihood that you develop a clot, but you could develop a clot earlier than that. And so you don't know. And so if you're not symptomatic, it's not really affecting you. You don't really notice it. It's only happening every now and then, you know, you don't really know. You run that risk of developing a clot and then having that clot flick off and cause a massive stroke. So I, I would work with this doctor on that one. Um, you know, there are other sort of treatments for that too, uh, for atrial fibrillation that people can potentially come off blood clotting medications. If it's a genetic issue, it could very well be that that this helps his genetics work better so that he doesn't have a clotting disorder, but we have no evidence for that. So I that's not something that I would personally run the risk on. But type 2 diabetes, absolutely. That can reverse type 2 diabetes. That can put that into complete remission for many people and uh, even come off insulin and, and injectables and other medication. And it will improve his life in a lot of other ways. Well, he, he will get a lot out of it. He will be a lot healthier. His life will be a lot happier. He will be on less medications. He will be healthier going forward and he will likely live a lot longer. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect him to be able to come off his blood clotting medication though, but diabetes and the rest of it. Absolutely. Mark Tech, thank you very much for the super chat. 34-year-old carnivore for two weeks, eczema and skin inflammation noticeably worse. Why is that? Beef, pork, salt, and a few spices, eggs, and seafood. Keto Mojo still only showing around 0.5 uh, millimoles of ketones. Um, yeah, so some of these skin issues can can get worse before they get better. You're in, a, in a, you know, a lot of people have teething issues within the first couple of weeks. Also, remember that when you're losing fat, you have a lot of fat. So, you know, but a lot of different fat soluble toxins that are stored in your adipose tissue that then get released. And then that sort of can cause weird issues, joint pain, muscle aches, brain fog, skin issues. And so, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, it just, you just need to wait that out. Eventually those will get out of your system. Your body will clear those out and they'll go away. But I mean, you look around, I mean, there's just hundreds of thousands of people that have specifically cleared up eczema. It, it just takes time. So some, like I said, sometimes it can, it can get worse before it gets better. If you want to, if you want to make sure that nothing is, is triggering this or exacerbating this, just cut down to beef, salt and water, nothing else and, uh, and see how you go. And then, you know, if you, if they start getting improvements and things get better, great. And, um, and they, and they will eventually, you know, they will some, some people, it, it takes months, you know, it's not just a, it's not just an overnight thing for everyone, for a lot of people it is, but, um, not for everyone. So some people have a more stubborn case. Some people are leaching toxins from their fat cells, you know, that then when they're losing weight, that that's going to keep triggering this. And so you just have to, you have to let this stuff work its way out of your system. And you have to be really, really on top of it with just beef, salt, and water. And there's also other things in your environment, different soaps and detergents and fragrances and makeups and all these sorts of things that can exacerbate this. So don't uh, don't forget about those as well. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about your your ketones. You know, it's um, as long as you're eating very fatty meat, very fatty meat, like one to two grams of fat per one gram of protein, and then adjusting for your body, how much body, how much you're absorbing, how much your body needs eat until it stops tasting good. You know, you should be, you should be fine. I've never once checked my ketones 
I, I don't think it matters much unless you're in the context of uh, cancer or something like that. And so, you know, you just, you're, you're supposed to eat meat. You're designed to eat meat, get the best quality meat that you have access to and can afford. And that makes you feel the best. And, you know, whatever happens, happens, you know, if your body is in ketosis, it's in ketosis. If it's not, it's not, it really doesn't matter. You will probably be in ketosis. You're, you are in ketosis. You're making blood sugar. You're making glycogen because you're, you know, you're conscious enough to be writing this pay, this uh, post. And so, you know, obviously you are making the requisite energy just because your ketones aren't through the roof. It uh, doesn't mean that you're not, not doing it. Your body may get better over time at doing this, but you know, the Inuits, like I said, their, their ketone levels are pretty, pretty low as well. So that, that's not, that's not necessarily a bad thing. The, the point is, is that you just eat, you eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. And that's, uh, and that's what you're supposed to do. You let your body get on with it. Uh, Mars Zane, thank you very much for the super chats. Not seeing a question with that, but possibly down the road. Here's one from our friend Brendan Roach from the previous super chat, who says, "My friend doesn't seem to be able to to eat. She has Crohn's disease, and after two mouthfuls of meat, uh, runs to the toilet and passes blood. Any suggestions? You can try fasting for a period of time. Um, I mean, if she has two bites of meat and then she has a bloody stool, it's probably that was going to come anyway." You know, even people with Crohn's, the transit time is not immediate. Um, and so uh, just fast, you know, take a couple of days off eating entirely and let that settle down and then try eating. Um, you know, you can also check out um, Dr. J. Salisbury's book, The Relation of Alimentation and Disease, the relationship between what we eat and the diseases we get. Um, and, uh, and he was talking about people with, you know, very serious digestion issues, you know, like Crohn's and also colitis and people having horrible times with their digestion and, um, and, uh, you know, curing that with a pure red meat and water diet. Also, we get used to, uh, you know, sort of psyching ourselves out when we're eating, um, when we're eating a, a meat only diet because we're like, Oh my God, meat's, meat's so bad. Meat's so worse. And she maybe even had, a gastroenterologist say, don't eat meat. Oh my God, that'll make it worse. Bloody well won't. Um, you know, there are, there are clinical trials in humans showing that if you just go on an elemental diet where you just don't, you just get just nutrients in nothing else, you know, it's a highly processed sort of thing as a scoop and you just getting nutrients and nothing else. That's a better treatment for an acute flare up of Crohn's than steroids, right? So this is crazy. So just not eating Certain things is a better treatment for Crohn's than steroids, uh, which is the gold standard. So that's what a steak is: is it's um, it's a, an, an elemental diet, and it's just it's just the nutrients you need, nothing else. Uh, but she could she could try fasting, you know, just fast for a couple of days. It'll settle down, you know. And if she has a sort of a psychosomatic response, you know, hard to hard to uh, make up, you know, it, hard to force your body to cause bloody diarrhea, but you know, it's, um, you know, it's likely that she's having that anyway, and it's not a consequence of the meat fast for a couple of days, let it settle down, start introducing some meat, red meat and water is really the most important things, uh, to eat things like pork, chicken, farmed fish, eggs, dairy could absolutely trigger her Crohn's. So red meat and water only at first, and then after things settle down, after a month or two, you can try reintroducing things. She'll probably have a problem with them. Stick to red meat probably for six months to a year for best results. Let the gut heal. Let that leaky gut settle down. Some people can reintroduce things like eggs, probably get rid of the egg whites. The egg yolks seem to be more tolerable. Pasture raised as well. All these little tips and tricks um, are there. You can have her watch my video on autoimmune disorders. It's called like, you know, auto, what they don't want you to know about autoimmune diseases. And, um, and with uh, my friend, Phil Escott, you know, he's been suffering with autoimmune issues for a long time. He has autoimmune Facebook groups and he's been dealing with a lot of this stuff and you just get more encouragement and advice, you know, from watching those as well. But uh, it, it will s settle down. Maybe just try fasting a couple days and uh, let it settle down initially and then then red meat only for a while 
Randall Reese, thank you very much for the super chat. I've uh, been doing carnivore since the beginning of the year. Have only had one pound of weight loss. Not currently tracking ma macros. Should I start? Nah, not necessarily. Uh, just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. If you think that you may be under eating, maybe. And you can just sort of see like, wow, you know, that's not all that many calories. Maybe I, maybe I should eat more. If you are chronically under eating, then you will suppress your metabolism and your body will stop allowing you to access your fat and you won't lose very much fat. Also, if your hormones are way out of balance, if your leptin is very elevated, it's called leptin resistance. It can be very difficult to lose uh, body fat until that leptin comes down, until those hormones normalize. Uh, and then you actually find that it, it's much easier to lose weight after that or lose fat specifically. That's the whole point is that you're wanting to lose fat. The other thing is exercise. If you are exercising, you will be putting on muscle. Muscle has weight. And so you will be offsetting some of the weight that you're losing from fat with the muscle that you're putting on. And so it can you know, change that up and, they, and make it look like you're not losing weight or losing fat, but you actually are losing fat. It's just you're putting on muscle as well. So those are things to think about also. Um, but yeah, if you're chronically under eating, you will slow your metabolism and you'll sort of lose a bit of weight and then it'll sort of plateau. And then you might actually gain weight eating less, right? Which is a bit paradoxical, especially to those dinosaurs who still desperately cling on to the calories in, calories out model, even though calories aren't a thing. Uh, you know, for, as, and as far as food energy is concerned, that's heat energy that has nothing to do with weight. Calories don't weigh anything. Um, molecules weigh things, atoms weigh things, calories don't weigh things. Um, so, you know, your body is very, you think of it as, as someone who's very fiscally responsible. You lose, you know, you get your hours cut at work. The last thing you want to do is start blowing out the credit card debt, you know, like, every government does right so what you want to do is you want to you know cut costs live within your means and survive until you know your your fortunes change and you get more hours at work you get another job you get a raise or a promotion all these sorts of things and so your body's looking at that in the same way like no we have less coming in less has to go out we need to shut this down but also if you've been in that situation for a number of years when you get your you, you start making more money the first thing you do is like yeah let's buy a ferrari it's like holy shit, that was awful. I'm going to put this money in the bank. I'm still going to, I, I, I'm comfortable living like this. We can happy to just not spend a whole bunch and be extravagant. I'm going to, I'm going to start saving as much as I can. That's your fat. And that's what your body does. Your metabolism goes down and it stays down. And then when you start eating more, your body goes, nope, that's going in the bank. And that's why people yo-yo die. They starve themselves for a while. They get decent results and then it plateaus and not losing, not losing, not losing. And it's miserable. And so I say, screw this. I'm going to go back to eating the way I was and bam, spikes up and they end up putting back on more weight than they lost. Um, so that's what happens. So you want to encourage your metabolism with a carnivore diet. If you're eating the right thing, then you can eat as much as your body's asking you for. And so you you do that and you'll encourage your, your tell your body, hey, we're not in a famine. We don't need to uh, scrimp and save. We don't need to put anything in the bank. We're fine. you know. And then your body goes, great, raises your metabolism. We don't need all this savings. We can, we can live a bit uh, you know, more, more liberally. So uh, that's, that's what I would do. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Some people lose a lot of weight early on. Some don't. You know, it just takes time. You know, just don't worry about the scale. The scale is not important. Your health is important. Your body composition is distant secondarily important. Weight is not important because weight does not denote body uh, body composition, right? So you just need to give it time. Let your body heal. Your body's going through a lot of different processes now. There's a lot of stuff to undo. And eventually it will. And eventually you'll keep losing more and more fat. And you'll, uh, yeah, you'll just keep getting more and more of the results that you want. Make sure you're eating enough. Eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Do that at least once a day, if not twice. Okay, super chat from Rob. Thank you very much. Uh, have parasites ever been concerned of yours while eating so much meat, especially rare? So I think this was Rob's question earlier. Um, uh, no, I haven't had a problem with that in um, in places that you know regularly, rigorously check their meat. Parasites aren't really a problem. I mean, there hasn't even been a case of trichinosis in farmed pigs. 
uh, in over 25 years, to my understanding. So unless there was a recent one, but um, you know, a few years ago, I heard it was you know 20 years without one, and so unless there was one in the last couple of years, then it's uh, 25 years without without one. So um, in those in that context, no, I wouldn't worry about that. Jennifer Hackett, thank you for the super chat. Uh, can a carnivore diet help or reverse improve mitochondrial uh, myopathy? Yeah, absolutely. So any ketogenic diet can. Um, it can. There's studies showing that uh, being on a ketogenic diet for a number of months um, increases the number of mitochondria you have by a factor of four and increases their efficacy and efficiency by a factor of four. So there's a massive, massive multiplication of, of mitochondrial health. Also, when you go on a carnivore diet specifically, you are removing things that cause direct damage to the mitochondria. A lot of these plant defense chemicals specifically target and attack and damage the mitochondria, like cyanide. Cyanide directly damages the mitochondria. There are 2,500 different plants that use cyanide, like cassava, you know, tapioca, right? That's, that's from cassava, and that has cyanide in it. Almonds, bitter almonds, all these sorts of things, they have it. Um, and, uh, there are people actually in, in, uh, Australia, I was just talking to a patient about this. who got very sick after eating some vegetable chips. Uh, she was carnivore and obviously she's like, ah, well, I'll have some vegetables are good for you. Had some vegetable chips, which is not the same as vegetables. And she got very unwell. She got very sick, hit her very hard and she was very unwell. And the next day she's like, what the hell was that? And she, she looked it up and these vegetable chips have tapioca flour in them. Then she looked it up, found that other people around Australia have been having health issues to do with tapioca flour and 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 uh, potentially even those vegetable chips, um, if I remember correctly. And she looked into it, and there was actually a you know for some reason there's a much higher load of cyanide in those batches of of tapioca and and vegetables uh, vegetable chips. And so, you know, potentially other people can have a problem. So, you know, the WHO, um, and this was, this was her sort of saying that she looked into it and said like the WHO, rec, you know, says that it's safe up to like 10 milligrams a day, which is like, do you want any cyanide in you a day? No, thank you. Um, but, it's, you know, it's just safe up to 10 milligrams a day. Okay, well, how much is in your damn vegetable chips? You know, you should have a, a bloody warning label on there saying, hey, only half a bag of this a day or else you meet your maximum recommended uh, cyanide allowance. You know, I mean, why the hell isn't that on the damn chips, right? So they have these things out there, and they're just like, yeah, no, there's there's a maximum here. You know, so our our, our hormetic friends are saying, oh, every, everything's good for you because of hormesis. Even the WHO says no more than this amount, but that's nowhere on these packets. That's nowhere on almonds. You know, it doesn't say you you can't eat more than this many almonds a day, or you'll exceed your limit for cyanide consumption nowhere does it say that so you know if you know that these things have have uh, you know a toxic load after a certain amount how the hell can you ethically or legally not put that on the bag and tell people hey don't eat this past this point more no more than one bag a day you know is safe it's just, obviously they would never sell another bag again and that's why they don't do that but like why the hell is it legal to not do that when you can have people have, have this sort of injury, uh, even, you know, uh, like cassava, bitter cassava can kill you the amount of uh, cyanide it has, uh, sweet cassava won't, but it's, um, you know, bitter cassava, they can sort of reduce the toxic load to a certain degree, but that doesn't mean that it's getting rid of all of it. And so even low dose, uh, chronic cyanide exposure can cause neurological dysfunction, cause thyroid damage, widespread, uh, mitochondrial myopathy, uh, mitochondrial damage and dysfunction. So that's very serious. And that's just one, that's just one of many, many plant toxins that damage the mitochondria. Seed oils directly damage mitochondria. Linoleic acid directly damages mitochondria. The mega sixes directly damage mitochondria. There's oxidative stress that, that uh, linoleic acid and omega sixes do in your body can directly damage mitochondria as well. So a carnivore diet is eliminating out as many of those as you possibly can. And, and your, your mitochondria just start to heal. It can take months, but it, it can heal. Um, let's see how many super chats we have. All right. Um, how about 
we cap it there. Uh, everyone sort of been going for um, sort of the last nearly two hours. So why don't we um, maybe ask people not to do any more super chats? I'll try to get through all of these and then we'll sort of end it. I've, uh, I think three hours is probably where I need to, to cap this sort of ending at noon. Um, it's probably where, where I should do it because I, I've, uh, we've got, it's, it's a Stria die to die. So you know, we got some things planned. There's actually rugby in town. I don't know if I'll actually have time to go see it. Um, because I've got so many other things on, but, uh, the sevens rugby is here and it's just like, it really pissed me off. I didn't get to see something and, uh, watch the USA, uh, play. I don't actually know. I took a look. I didn't really recognize any of the players on the U S team. So, um, but, uh, yeah, it'd be good to sort of, uh, watch them play anyway and support, support the home team in the away crowd. So, um, and then obviously Australia, uh, always support the home, home country that I'm in as well, unless they're playing America. So, um, but yeah, it'd be great to see those guys. Um, so, uh, super chat from Jasmine Ortiz. Thank you very much for that. Doctor, I've been on carnivore for seven days now. Overall, I feel great. However, sometimes my stomach feels sore and bloated. Is this common? Um, you know, not necessarily, but you know, it's not, it's not, it's not abnormal. You know, your body's going to be going through a lot of things. It's only been a week. That's very early days. And a lot of times your, your body's healing from, from, uh, from a lot of things that, um, you know, damage that you've done to your body. So just give it time. You know, it's likely that this is something that's going to heal. Uh, just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good, cut out everything else, herbs, spices, all those sorts of things, because your body could be reacting negatively to those, um, red meat and water for best results. And, you know, should settle down and you should, should keep getting better, better as long as it's just, you're not eating anything else with the meat, especially red meat. You can also do like a, a food journal diary where you sort of see like, you know, if certain meats or certain spices or whatever, you know, cut out, just cut out all the spices just to be safe. But certain meats, if they're giving you a stomach ache or not, you know, say what you ate at what times and, you know, if you got stomach aches and if you did at what time, sometimes you can see an association there and, uh, and that can help guide you as well. Um, Silver Cat 151, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. My 76-year-old husband has stage 5, less than 10% kidney function, and two uh, iliac aneurysms. Would a carnivore diet help with his kidneys? I'm worried whether it would help or make things worse. Um, in, in my experience, and according to the literature, higher protein diets improve it. That's what the literature shows, that higher protein diets improve kidney function or can improve kidney function. It depends on what's causing the kidney function, a dysfunction. Um, and carnivore diets absolutely remove so many things that are directly damaging to your kidneys like oxalates and other toxins that can be nephrotoxic. Also, uh, there's new research coming out showing that ketogenic diets uh, in general will help with polycystic kidney disease, which is a, a major cause of kidney dysfunction and, and um, failure. So not really going to probably not do anything for the aneurysms, but the kidney disease, potentially, depending on what's causing it, it could it could improve that. And so I, I would think that that would be uh, helpful uh, for him. And um, I've, I've seen a number of people reverse even uh, that level of kidney dysfunction. And it's certainly not going to make him worse drink enough water. As long as he's not on fluid restrictions, you know, obviously that, you know, take that in, um, you know, listen to your doctor on that. But, you know, if he, otherwise you'll drink as much water as he's, as is appropriate for him to drink, that can help improve the kidney functions. And then going on a carnivore diet has absolutely helped people's kidney functions, even with as advanced a disease as your husband. Depends on what's causing his, his kidney dysfunction as to whether that's going to improve it and make it better, but it will not make it worse. Um, I don't think so. That's, um, that's, I've, I've never seen people's kidney function get worse on this. And, you know, again, according to the literature, higher protein diets, improve kidney function. They don't worsen them. So good luck with that. Jason Hum, thank you very much for the very generous super chat. It's very kind of you. Um, Jason says, I don't have any questions. I lived the same life as you for the last five years. Life is optimal and I'm thriving. I hope to meet you someday. Uh, what you're doing is great. Well, thank you, Jason. I really appreciate that. And that's awesome that you've been doing this for five years. It's, you know, it's, it's great to see more and more people that have been 
doing this for a long time and can you know share their experiences with others and show them like, hey, look, no, we're all doing this and, it, and it's all great. And so uh, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, hope to meet you too. You know, if you're in the States, I'll be at KetoCon in, what is it, May, end of May. And uh, there's a number of other um, conferences that I'll be at um, in Australia and in England and uh, even one in Spain. So that's kind of cool too. And uh, yeah, and so if you're around, definitely come out and, uh, and check them out. Penny Awful, thank you very much for the super chat. To what extent do calories matter on carnivore? Well, look, I mean, it's, you, you, well, calories don't matter because it's not a, it's not a proper a description of, of the energy that we're getting from food, but food matters. You know, if you're eating a certain amount of food, your body's going to respond in a certain in a certain way. If you're eating less, then your body's not going to have sufficient nutrients and nutrition uh, to function properly. You're going to slow down your metabolism. You may actually even gain fat. You certainly won't be as healthy as you could be. If you are eating to the extent that your body is asking you to generally that that's optimal if you're force feeding yourself past that's usually very pretty difficult to overeat on a carnivore diet because it just doesn't taste good and you don't want to but you can do it and if you do that then yeah sure you know it's not going to be the the right thing for your body and it could mean that you put on extra fat or you know have other sorts of issues but um as i think what people generally mean when they ask this question is do they have to track macros and all these sorts of things on a carnivore diet? And to that, I would generally say no, if you, because you can listen to your body's natural instincts. And so if your body is telling you to eat a certain amount, I think that that's pretty safe to listen to that. If you eat more than that, then yeah, sure. You're, you're getting more than you want. So the idea, all oh, calories don't matter or the amount of food you eat doesn't matter. That's not, that's not what we're saying. Certainly not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you don't have to tra track your macros because your body tracks your macros. Your biology, your physiology, and biochemistry track your macros. Your brain tracks your macros. You have sensors in your stomach that track your macros and micros. And they see, yeah, that's how much nutrients we have in there. We don't need any more. And so you get a signal to your tongue that don't we don't need any of this stuff anymore. It stops tasting good. It tastes less and less good. You get negative feedback from the food that you're eating. Even though it tastes good, the next bite will not taste quite as good and on and on and on um, until it doesn't taste good at all. And then that's you just stop eating. You just listen to your body. And, and uh, once it stops tasting good, you stop eating. So in that regard, um, no, you don't need to like perfectly track exactly what you're eating as long as you're not on taking, you know, like corticosteroids, like your know, prednisone, prednisolone, something like that, um, or other medications that can that get, that can alter your, your hunger signals. Um, you know, you should be able to, especially, you know, long-term, you should be able to listen to your hunger signals as so you just listen to your body. So you eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good and you stop once it stops tasting good. And to that extent, you don't need to, to track macros and micros, uh, but yeah, you can, you eat more food and that's going in your body and food has weight and that goes into your body and then you have weight, right? So that's, that's where that is. Calories don't weigh anything. You know, you have a glass of water at room temperature, you heat it up to, you know, by 50 degrees, has more calories, weighs the same damn thing. So uh, calories is not, a, is not an issue. Food is an issue. You want to get enough. You want to get the right amount for your body and just like any lion or hyena or vole they know what to eat they stop eating naturally they don't get obese they don't get the, these these sorts of diseases of excess and civilization that we get unless they're eating the wrong thing and so if you're eating the right thing your body should tell you the right amount to eat uh clean coal thank you very much uh for the super chat not seeing a, a question attached but oh here we go uh can an undiagnosed BAM condition be discovered uh, on a carnivore diet. Um, it would depend on what you mean by a BAM condition. Um, like bile acid malabsorption? Is that, I'm trying to think of the acronyms. I mean, there's just so many thousands of different acronyms in, in medicine. So, um, unless it's in your particular field, you don't necessarily know the acronyms for that. 
I'm going to guess that that's, you know, the bile acid malabsorption sort of issue. Um, yeah, I mean, potentially, you know, if um, I, I never treated that, it's not something that, that I do. That's not part of my practice. But, um, you know, if you have if you have a condition where you're not able to uh, absorb fat properly, you know, and you're eating a higher fat diet, then, you know, that can that obviously can raise its head. I, I would still just eat the amount of fat that your body's asking you to. And um, because you're going to absorb a certain amount. So let your body absorb that amount. And um, and then, you know, don't don't worry about the rest. It could be that your body fixes it. If you're not doing well and, you're, and your body really can't absorb fat and you need to, you know, you need to sort of accent that and your doctor is is concerned that you need more fat and all this sort of stuff, which maybe one in a thousand are going to at this point. Um, you know, then you can you can entertain things like ox bile supplementation, which normally I don't think is a good idea. But also if it's a malabsorption issue and your body's just not able to absorb the bile, you know, that may not actually do anything anyway. Um so either way, I'd still do the same thing. Eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Adjust the amount of fat to your absorption levels. And hopefully, hopefully you do well with that. Plant sparing carnivore. Thank you very much for the super chat. Um, had COVID. Sorry, had COVID five months ago. Um, neurological symptoms of depression, anxiety persist. I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, LFTs are optimal. Good. Um, ALP raised to 150. Um, high sensitivity CRP under one. ESR is uh, 0.48. Few studies show long COVID symptoms worse in those jabs. Your thoughts. Appreciate your work. Um, I... Yeah, I, I don't know too much about this. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of things I've seen peripherally. There, there are people that are doing a lot of really good research on this, like you know, Dr. Peter McCullough and um, and um, uh, Dr. Malone, who like invented the technology, um, the the RNA vaccine technology back in like the 90s. I think that's the original patents for that. And other people used his technology to to sort of do these sorts of things. Um, and so, you know, they're very well versed in these. Um, I know that, that Dr. Peter McCullough, who is, is a, a, a preeminent cardiologist down in Texas, and um, in his specific field of cardiology, he's the most published uh, person in his whole field. So, you know, he's he's no slouch anyway. And so I think he's published a, a protocol on how to, how to sort of sort out getting these spike proteins out of your system and help with long COVID as well. Um, I, I don't know what that is offhand, but you know you can look that up. Just look up his name and and um, you know uh, detoxing uh, protocol. Um, and then I was speaking to a patient about this the other day, so this is secondhand information. But they were saying that one of Dr. Uh, McCullough's um, you know statements was that that people that use nicotine seem to not get as affected because the the nicotine sort of bound onto receptors that uh that, that displace the spike protein and potentially this could help with long covid don't quote me on that that is that is second hand that's something that someone said that peter mccullough may have said look it up see if he does that but you know there are protocols out there um that you know by peter mccullough and others that could potentially help with this i mean being on a on a, carb, a carnivore diet is going to at least help your body you know, optimize in as many ways as it can and hopefully get rid of a lot of other things that can maybe exacerbating the long COVID issues and help in a, in a lot of other ways. You know, depression, anxiety, these these are generally uh, helped quite significantly by keto carnivore diets, ketogenic carnivore diets. And so I would I would certainly try that if you haven't done that. I mean, it says you're in the name plant sparing carnivores, you're probably already on that. But, you know, if you have any little things slipped in there, just get rid of them. And then uh, if that's not enough, then I would I would try to check out um, the different protocols um, like uh, Dr. McCullough's. That's probably one. If I had that problem, I probably that's the one I would probably would use. He's just been doing tons and tons and tons of research on this. And and I think that uh, that that's one I would 
I would personally go for. Stanislav, thank you very much for the super chat. My favorite daily meal uh, I like is 500 grams or 20% beef mince uh, mixed with five eggs, air fried in form of meatballs and added chicken liver. Is this good for carnival? Yeah, it sounds great. You just do make sure you're getting enough fat. I mean, the liver is great. Um, you know, if you enjoy the, the beef, you know, it's like, you know, 20%, I'm assuming that's 20% fat, um, might be a little lean, but, um, you know, just make sure if you're getting constipated, you know, eat more fat, add more fat to that and you'll get fattier mints and, uh, don't, you know, cook it so much that you cook out all the fat and, um, and you should be fine, but no, that's great. You know, just as long as you're getting enough fat and you're doing well, then yeah, go for it. Max the dream. Thank you very much for the super chat. Any advice on gaining weight on carnivore? I'm young and skinny. Should I avoid milk starting out? Do avoid milk starting out. That changes your that fundamentally changes your metabolism, spikes your insulin, which you don't really want. And that can cause all sorts of different problems. Testosterone it can, it can tank your testosterone and growth hormone as well. Um, not just one glass of milk, but you know, um, just excessive carbohydrates long-term can do that. Um, milk probably has different growth factors and things like that, but people would argue probably increases it, you know, who knows, but either way, the, um, raw milk maybe, but you know, the carbohydrates raising insulin can interrupt your normal, uh, testosterone and growth hormone, uh, metabolism. So, uh, I would avoid that. And also it just screws with your, it just screws with your metabolism in general, puts you in a fat storage metabolism as opposed to a fat utilization metabolism and you don't want to gain fat you want to gain healthy and lean body mass you don't want to gain fat so i would just i would avoid milk i'd avoid dairy and i would eat uh, just as much fatty meat as you uh enjoy and work out you know you need to lift weights you're still a young young uh person so you know you need to need to, uh, sometimes just, you, you have to just put on years and years and years of work. I was pretty skinny when I was a kid and I started working out more regularly, you know, hitting the gym, just lifting weights and lifting weights and exercising and working out. I was just, I just started putting on more and more weight and more and more weight. And eventually I got to a, a pretty good muscle base that I maintain pretty easily on a carnivore diet. So you just need to work out, push yourself in the gym, you know, responsible, uh, but you know, uh, intense workout regime and you need to eat enough. So you need to eat, keep eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. You need to try to do that at least twice a day. If you are, uh, on, if you're on a, um, uh, you know, if you're trying to gain muscle, if you're working out a lot, right? So, you know, you need to eat enough. If you're working out, you're sprinting, you're lifting weights and you're eating enough, you'll put on weight. You'll put on muscle more easily than, um, than you ever have before hands down and it's lean body mass you're not putting on but it's not doing the stupid bulking nonsense you're just putting on a whole bunch of fat and glycogen and water weight that they didn't have to lose anyway you're just putting on muscle mass and so that's and that that's that's there for good i mean you keep that as long as you um, keep stimulating it and keep eating right kimberly marshall thank you very much for the super chat when you say eat more fat and 80, 20 ground beef is still lean, uh, what would you recommend? Wagyu and not drain the fat, then add butter. Well, it doesn't, it's not necessarily Wagyu. It's just, you know, a higher fat content. So, um, you know, I say one to two grams of, of fat per one gram of protein. That's generally the range that people want to get into. It depends on their body and what they're doing. Um, but you just aim for that. What is two grams of fat to one gram of protein in ground beef terms? It's 65% lean, 35% fat. That's two to one fat to protein. So that's what you want to sort of aim for. 73.27 is around one to one ish, you know, so that's pretty good. Um, you know, so that, that's what I would aim for, you know, that sort of range. You know, if you're not quite getting that, if it's sort of 80, 20, add some grass fed butter to it or some grass fed tallow, even better. Butter probably tastes better, but the tallow probably is better, uh, but they're both good. And so, but it's, it's all about, you know, taking it in as much as your body wants, right? And so if you're getting constipated, dry, hard, rocky stools, 
you know, you're not eating enough fat. If you're getting liquid stools, you could be eating too much fat, or you could be so constipated that you're getting a pseudo obstruction and there's just liquid stools is, is squirting around it and you get, you know, liquid diarrhea, watery diarrhea intermixed with, you know, these horrible boulders that come out every, every now and then, um, then you need a lot more fat. So that, that's what I mean. Uh, everyone's going to be different in, in what they, in what their body needs, go by your stools and go by your body and, and what tastes good and what your body uh, is telling you to do. Coffee house for truth seekers. Thank you very much for the super chat. I was at the hospital today uh, with severe vomiting. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It tasted like fish and a chat bot told me it could be the THA from excess protein. Uh, I don't know about that. I've, I've certainly never heard that. I don't know why you would... Um, um, I don't know why you would get vomiting from um, from that. I don't actually know what THA is standing for um, as well. Again, these are these acronyms that, you know, uh, th there's so many acronyms in the world. I, I just, I don't know them all. So <laughs> um, uh, please do spell those out, uh, everyone. Um, don't just assume that I know the, the acronym because I know, some of them, I don't know all of them, but either way, I don't, I don't think that anything, um, you know, that, that you're going to get vomiting from too much protein. Um, either way, just listen to your body, take it easy. When you start eating again, when your stomach settles down, just start with, you know, just small amounts, ease your way into it, lift your way up. If you're eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good, you shouldn't have any of those problems. It should not cause vomiting that many 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 things can cause vomiting i have never heard of uncontaminated meat causing uh vomiting i've eaten a lot of beef jerky i've eaten a lot of lean meat i've eaten a lot of fatty meat I've never seen that and i haven't heard of that either um so i don't think that that's what it was but you know either way just be careful ease your way back into eating and you should be fine Uh, Le Petulante, thank you very much for the super chat. This is very generous of you. Hello, Dr. Chafee. Uh, my mom developed Guillain-Barre symptoms uh, three months ago. Still in pain after two courses of immunoglobulin. Any feedback, please, with Guillain-Barre syndrome and carnivore, please. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings from France. Well, hello, France. Um, Guillain-Barre is a neurological disorder, sort of an ascending paralysis, starts from the feet up. It's very serious and um, obviously needs to be treated directly by a neurologist generally in the hospital. And so um, do listen to the doctors and, uh, and, and, and follow any sort of medical protocols and medications. Um, as far as car carnivore is concerned, I have seen a lot of extremely encouraging neurological recoveries going on a carnivore diet. I mean, even, even you, know, um, you know, that uh, my friend Dave Mack, who I've had on the podcast and I've done a couple of lives with, he had a stroke 30 years ago, had right-sided weakness that hadn't shifted in that all that time. He went carnivore for two months and it, it significantly improved his symptoms so that he didn't really have to worry about it. He was able to, to walk normally, go up and down stairs, normal, was able to run up and down stairs. Uh, now, whereas normally he, he was very, very, very unstable on his feet. So it can, it can, it has anyway uh, helped with significant neurological recovery. So that could very well be the case with your mom. I don't have any um, studies for that. You know, this is just something that is, is very much worth trying and seeing. Specifically with Guillain-Barre, it's not something that's common enough that I've seen too many cases of this. Uh, so I don't know of too many people that have had Guillain-Barre and gone carnivore. However, there are some. But again, this is just there's a few people's individual experiences that were positive. And also they get other a lot of other positives from the diet as well. So it's still worth doing. Hopefully that improves your mom's symptoms it will improve a lot of other things for her as well. So if it's something that she is able to get on and uh, I think it would help, hopefully it will help with the Guillain-Barre. It will definitely help with everything else. So good luck with that. Good luck with you, to your mom. 
Bishop Steep Learning, thank you for the, the super chat. Thoughts on bone broth? Um, it's fine. You know, I mean, I don't think you should be just guzzling tons of it um, because it might make you eat less meat, which is what you need. Bone broth obviously isn't doesn't have all the nutrients that you need. And so you might be, you might end up eating less meat, which has all the nutrients you need and not be, not be so well off. But, you know, when people are having coffee or tea and they like having a warm drink from, for the ritual side of things, having bone broth or, you know, uh, you know, the British used to call it beef tea. My great grandfather used to do that, have like a thermos of this stuff and go to, you know, soccer games or something like that. And they'd have beef tea They just sort of warm something warm to keep you uh, warm throughout the, the cold, miserable, freezing games. And so, you know, that's something that you can do. And then that, that's something that could be quite enjoyable for people. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to town on it. I wouldn't go too much because, you know, you know, like I talk about you know, with your taste, you know, your body wants these nutrients. If your body wants those nutrients, they're going to taste better. And so there are nutrients in bone broth. And so you'll get that good taste. So it tastes good, tastes good, tastes good, tastes good. And then your body's going to taste less good, less good, less good, less good, less good. And so now you start eating meat. Those same nutrients that were in the beef tea now don't taste as good. The bone broth don't taste as good because you already have them. The other ones taste good, but the overall experience may be a bit lower. This is all theoretical, of course, but you know, it could be that this affects your taste and it stops tasting as enjoyable earlier before you get all the other nutrients that you need, right? So you're getting some of them and that that can sort of curtail your experience to it. So that's my concern with that. And that's something that that the long-term people like in uh, zero carb health um, have said, I've, I've seen them mention that in years past about how this, this could potentially make you eat less and get less nutrition, which is not what you want. So, but if you're using it every now and then having a cup here and there, and because you enjoy it, I don't think there's any problem with that. Um, just don't, don't, uh, have too much. I wouldn't have it every day and, uh, certainly not have uh, it in abundance every day. Hey everyone. If you need a little extra help getting started on a carnivore diet and my online resources that I have for free aren't enough for you, you can go to www.howtocarnivore.com and sign up for a 30 day carnivore challenge where you'll have online resources, group support, weekly zoom meetings, as well as the ability to chat live with myself, Simon Lewis, and the others in the challenge who can help you and support you and give you extra advice and help you along the way. So if that sounds like something that would be beneficial to you, then please go to howtocarnivore.com and sign up. All right. Thanks guys. We'll see you there. Kevin Moore. Thank you very much for the super chat. What is your opinion on fermented foods and non-alcoholic fermented drinks like drinking vinegars? Um, does fermenting the food make it safer for the body? It certainly does make it better. It can, it can lower the toxic load of certain plants. I mean, I don't, I don't think it'll lower toxic load in every plant. I don't think you can just ferment anything necessarily. I think there's things that we've traditionally been fermenting. We've been traditionally fermenting them for a reason. There's it's sort of the, stood the test of time. That's going to lower the toxic load and increase the bioavailability of the nutrients. That's why we ferment a lot of things. That's why we put things through a process like nishtamalization, which is what we used to do to corn, well, what the Mesoamericans used to do to corn in order to lower the toxic load and increase the bioavailability. And the people just said, oh, corn, look at that. It's easy. It grows well. You know, let's take it. And they they took the corn. They didn't take the nishtamalization, which is where the word tamale comes from. And so not great. Not what you want. And so you're not going to get as many nutrients and it's going to have a higher toxic load. So yes, it will reduce the toxic load. Does that make the toxic load zero? Don't know. Depends on what it is. Depends on what's fermenting. It depends on what can be addressed by fermenting. Probably not. It's probably reducing it, but not eliminating the toxic load. Um, and vinegars, I mean, that's like oxidized alcohol. I don't know if that's a great idea, certainly not to drink it. I certainly wouldn't recommend drinking apple cider vinegar. I don't think there's any point on a carnivore diet. We, we got to think of these things biologically, what we're designed for. What were we eating 50,000 years ago during an ice age? It wasn't apple cider vinegar, you know, most likely. Apples probably didn't exist, you know, in the tundra, on the frozen uh, tundras of, of the ice ages. So really just eating meat. And so I think that that's what you do uh, as a baseline. 
some things are going to be more or less bad for you. And fermenting is certainly going to improve things. And apple cider vinegar may have benefits in certain circumstances like any medicine can. But you don't just take antibiotics for the sake of taking antibiotics because they, well, they have antimicrobial effects. So like, yeah, but you don't have an infection. So that's not a benefit, right? That's not something that's going to help you. You're actually going to damage yourself. You're going to kill your microbiome and your oral biome. And, uh, you know, unhealthy bugs can can take over and you don't have the diversity, right? So that's, that's the reason why you wouldn't take uh, antibiotics just for no damn reason. But then people say, oh, you should take garlic and you should take ginseng because they're antimicrobial. Like, same reason why you wouldn't take antibiotics. You shouldn't take those things. So same, same, you know, if, if there's some sort of reason that you're taking apple cider vinegar and it's helping with that, fine. You're using sort of a medicinal person purpose. I can't think of any uh, medicinal purposes for apple cider vinegar in the context of a carnivore diet. I don't, I don't, think that that would benefit you if you want to try it and see how you go and go for it like I, I i don't know why it would help you or what situations it would help you in um but is it less bad than other things sure but that doesn't mean that it's the best thing for you so people people should understand that that's what i'm talking about when i talk about you know the recommendations that i have for eating the way i eat i'm talking about what what do i think is the absolute best optimal maximum that you can do. I'm not talking about, well, everything is bad except for this. I'm saying that this is the pinnacle and that's what, what I aim for. And so if you're aiming for the pinnacle, this is what I would do. Um, other things can be perfectly fine and be a lot healthier, you know, especially in respect to other people eating other garbage. Um, but the bar I'm setting is, okay, what's optimal? Let's shoot for the best, you know? And then if you miss, you're, you're at least you're missing up, right? You know, because you're, you're still, you know, you're going up and say, oh, let's go, let's shoot for the middle here. And then you, you hit lower than that aim for the top. And if you, you fall short of that, you're still doing a lot better than, than everyone else. So that's, that's what I mean when I talk about those sorts of things. So yes, you can ferment food. Is it the best thing you could ever do? Um, as far as a toxic load sort of thing? No, from a, a nutritional standpoint, no, you get all the nutrients you need from meat. You don't need fermented foods. You know, if you wanted to reset your microbiome, that's something you could think about. If you had fermented food that had the live bacteria in it, which is not always the case if you're buying it from the store, um, then you take a small amount, chew it up with meat, you swallow it together so you get that bacteria past your stomach and small intestines to, to where it's uh, it can sort of live and thrive. You probably can do the exact same with, uh, you know, with uh, Greek yogurt, with plain Greek yogurt, and uh, and do just fine. Uh, I've never used fermented plants. I've had some Greek yogurt, things like that. I'll I'll probably get my microbiome checked here at some point, um, but I've never had any sort of issues that would make me suspect that I have a microbiome uh, dysfunction. And um, you know, the Inuits don't really use fermented vegetables or anything like that. They have some of the healthiest microbiomes ever studied when they're only eating meat. So, and also if you're, oh, and, um, and when you're, when you when you have an established microbiome, the things that you're eating, should you be eating the right thing should perpetuate that microbiome. So, um, I think that, you know, if you, once you get that done with fermented vegetables or fermented dairy, fermented meat, you know, whatever, uh, once you've established your microbiome, it should can perpetuate just eating meat. And that seems to be what happens with the Inuit and, and others. Let's go the prebiotics, prebiotic and probiotic, right? Probiotic has the bacteria and the prebiotic feeds the bacteria. Meat is a prebiotic. And so once you get the right bacteria in there, it should, should keep them there. Barnaby Jones and Danger Dog, thank you very much for the super chat. Does lactose feed cancer like other sugars do? Any, any, well, so lactose is, is a disaccharide, meaning there's two carbohydrate molecules uh, chemically bonded. Uh, and, and, and that's glucose, one part glucose, one, one part galactose. And so your body cleaves that, and then it's just glucose coming into your body. So it's glucose. And yes, that will feed cancers. Galactose goes in your body, it's metabolized and processed and turned into glucose. So yes, that, that can indeed feed your cancers. Uh, like other other uh, carbohydrates do. 
Stanislav, thank you very much for the super chat. Is it healthy to eat whatever melts and falls to the bottom of the air fryer after cooking? Uh, yeah, it should be fine as long as you're, you're sort of keeping it clean. You're not sort of letting it build up and get get you know, manky. Um, but you know, if it's if it's sort of clean when you start and you sort of do that and then it renders fat out, you, yeah, you can absolutely pour that fat back on. I mean, and you should. I was actually going to suggest that earlier when we we're talking about you know air frying the the meat and liver and things like that. Uh, yeah, you should be, you, you should, you, you should be able to eat the rendered fat uh, at the bottom of that. Absolutely. Rob Stewart, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. Could you advise on your refrigerator setup? My, um, most beef, beefle keep in plastic or glass. Uh, but one of your older vids with fridge had it everywhere open air any particulars uh, for preservation thank you for what you do so if you if you're so what you want to do is it, you, you get it in um, the, the the cryovac packs from the store right so you're not doing it yourself that that should be able for beef anyway don't do this with like chicken or pork or fish or anything like that but um, for beef you can keep it in that vacuum seal cryovac uh, packaging and um, and then that, then that will um, sit in the fridge for very safely for a long time. You don't need to freeze it. You you can. It's very common that people like restaurants will see like thirty day wet age, thirty day dry age steaks. If you really want to spend a fortune on a, on a dinner, and that's what wet aging is. It's just keeping in that cryovac pack, and it just sort of softens and tenderizes and and gets nicer. Um, and then after that, you're sort of doing a bit of a dry age. So I'm not doing a full dry age where I'm letting the bacteria soak in and get hard and, and things like that on the outside and then trimming that off and just having the inside. Uh, it's more of a, of just drying it out. So you might call it like a dry brine, although I don't really use salt anymore. I just let it dry out a bit and that concentrates the flavor. If you put salt on it before enough salt for you, it doesn't have to be a ton of salt, just as much salt as you enjoy, then uh, that salt soaks in, helps dry it out a bit, and it concentrates the flavor. It browns much better too. And so it sort of crisps up and is nice and has a nicer flavor. And so that's what I do. So you put it on a wire rack on a cooking sheet and uh, not touching anything else. So it can't be touching anything else. You need air circulating around all sides. Uh, at some point, you want to flip the steaks over so the bottom side gets more air exposure as well. Um, as long as you do that, it doesn't go bad. It just dries out, turns into beef jerky. You know, if you leave it long enough, don't leave it that long. And, um, you know, so you play with it. I mean, when I do, I mean, I'm having like three inch thick steaks, you know, so, you know, it's big, big bastards. And so that, I mean, those, those things can be sitting in the fridge for you know two, three weeks. It's still moist in the inside, right? Not, not as much, but you know, it is, and it, it just tastes amazing. Browns and crisps, uh, you know, so much better than any other steak you'll ever find in your entire life. It's just amazing. And um, so just play with that. Play with, you know, this thickness of steaks that you have. If, you know, it's much thinner. It's like you, you don't really want to do that more than a couple of days because it's just going to dry out too much. And it's not going to it's not going to be as nice. So just do that and um, and see how much uh, uh, time you like having it in the fridge and just make sure it's not touching anything so that it doesn't grow bacteria. Because if it's touching other meat, it'll grow bacteria at that point of contact. Giovanni, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, if I have two cheating days of a lot of sugar, is that a dramatic switch if you are in full ketosis for the body uh, or the body adapts to that? Look, you know, anytime you're putting poison in your body, it's going to have an effect on your body. It's going to have a negative effect on your body. The longer you're, you're on a ketogenic diet, you're not eating sugar, the less your body worries about you doing something silly like trying to poison it with sugar. Um, and so when you're eating chronic carbohydrates, your body preloads insulin, it pre-makes it, and it's ready to go because it is so important for you to get that blood sugar down because it is toxic uh, after, after normal uh, blood sugar levels. And so when you stop doing that, your body goes, oh, thank God, this person is actually being smart about this and it doesn't preload your insulin. 
Okay, so what happens is then you eat sugar and your blood sugar goes up too high and your body's scrambling to make insulin. So you have a transient bigger spike in sugar, but then it comes down. So is it all that huge of a deal? Not all that much. In a couple of days, you'll start pre-making insulin again because your body is, you know, just given up on you and just decided it can't trust you and it just has to make this stuff and defend itself. Um, and then you stop after that, you know, fine. That's better than, than if you kept going, certainly. And so having a couple of days, every couple of months, not every week, um, then, you know, it's, uh, you know, your body can tolerate that. If you're doing it every single week, then really what you're doing is you're keeping yourself addicted to an addictive substance and you're never going to get over cravings and you're never going to get uh, through this and feeling the best and being in, you know, proper ketosis and and having your body work properly. It's going to take a couple days to recover from that and get back into ketosis. And then you're eating sugar again and, uh, and you're just starting the process over again. You're keeping yourself addicted. So I certainly wouldn't do two days every week by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think that's great for you. Also remember that, you know, you, you guys should watch Dr. Gary Fetke's um, lecture on fructose and sugar and how it's, how it's a toxin, how, how high blood sugar is a toxin. So as he points out, you, you, at any time you have four grams of glucose in your body, four grams of sugar. And just increasing that by one gram up to five grams is a toxic load It's toxic to your body and your body responds to it as a toxin by trying to detoxify it. That's what raises the insulin to get that blood sugar below four grams. Below four grams, it's safe. Above four grams, it is toxic. And so after years and years and years of doing this to yourself, you can develop diabetes, your blood sugar starts going up in spite of massively raised insulin, and you start getting significant damage to your body through glycation. Those fructose molecules or glucose molecules, fructose molecules do it too, all carbohydrate molecules do it physically fusing to other molecules and, and permanently damaging them. And this is what permanently damages diabetics. This is what causes them to die. This is what causes them to get their legs amputated, for their kidneys to fail, for their heart to fail, for their brain to fail, for their life to fail. So this is from one extra gram of glucose in your body. It is poison. So you know our, our friends who drone on about hormesis without any evidence or any backing or any specific examples, this might be a useful example. Below four grams, glucose is beneficial. Above four grams, it is toxic. So that's the line. And you have to know the line. You know, just like the WHO says, you know, 10 milligrams of cyanide is, is fine. It's not fine. Well, let's say it's fine. At least you're drawing a line. And then you say, okay, well, I'm going to eat this amount. They don't tell you how much cyanide is in cassava or in almonds or in tapioca or in any specific product that uses any of those ingredients. They don't tell you that. They just have it in some obscure back web page on the WHO saying, oh yeah, I don't have more than 10 milligrams of, of cyanide. And then you look at tapioca. Okay. How much tapioca is in here? How much cyanide is in? Oh, gee, okay. That's 16 times the amount of cyanide I'm supposed to have in a day in this one little tiny packet of uh, vegetable chips. They don't tell you that crap. But, you know, there, if something is hormetic and also hormesis with, with, uh, with cyanide that I'm aware of, it just causes harm. And so, um, you know, there's no hormetic line there. There's a, there's a, well, we, we, we're okay with you if you poison yourself to this extent. Thanks. I appreciate that. How about you? How about you do it? You know, and, uh, and then you can tell me how great that was. Um, so I think that, that our body, really bends over backwards to try to keep your blood sugar down because it is so toxic. You're raising your insulin, which disrupts your hormones, all your hormones, and completely rearranges your entire biochemical structure, your metabolism, and your physiology. That is a major, major, major blast to your system. That's a major effect that it's having. It changes your brain and your heart and the rest of your organs from running on their optimal energy source, which are ketones, to now run, running on the secondary backup uh, fuel source, which are which is glucose. It's so important to your body to detoxify your blood sugar down below four grams that it is willing to let your brain run on secondary fuel source. 
that should tell you something. That's pretty shocking. So you can cheat, but it's just like having cheat days with cigarettes, cocaine, alcohol, heroin, you know, child abuse. Like you just, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. It's something that, that is, is causes a net harm, uh, in, in the world, right? So you don't want to do that. So there are some things that you just, you just want to cut out. Sugar is really one of them. Sugar is absolutely one of the worst. And also when you have cheat days, people tend to splurge. They tend to really binge on those days because, well, this is my day and I can just go to town. Well, it's like having a, a cheat day with, with cigarettes. Well, I don't smoke during the weekend. I just, just go to town on the weekend. You end up, you end up doing more damage. Um, and you, and you keep yourself addicted. And that's the main thing is that it just makes you feel miserable during the week. And you just want to keep having sugar and you're like, oh, as soon as that starts calming down, you go and get yourself addicted again. So I like, yes. Is it better to eat sugar twice a day than every day? If you're eating the same amounts daily, sure. If you're eating more in those two days than you would during the week, no. And, um, and is it better than not eating any sugar at all? Definitely not. So, uh, please take that under advisement. And, uh, and think about that, you know, if you wanted some sugar every now and then, like every few months, maybe, you know, but do remember what that's doing to you. That is damaging your body. It is a toxic dose. And so your body's going to be toxic, going to be, have toxic effects. That's all there is to it. Can you recover from it? Sure. Um, do you want to keep doing that to your body? Not really. So do it that what you will, but you know, that's, that's uh, a very, you know, uh, good explanation as to why I don't touch the stuff anyway. So this will be the last one, everyone. I think that's, that's pretty good. We're, we're probably going to end right around, uh, 12 o'clock, which is, uh, which is perfect. So last question from, uh, Gord Gamey. Thank you very much for the super chat and thanks everyone for the super chats. It's very, very kind of you. Sorry. Um, that we couldn't go longer, but, um, I think three hours is, is pretty good, um, or two and a half hours. Uh, Gord Gamey says, uh, thanks for all you do. My friend uh, is type 2 diabetic, just went through triple bypass. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Doc says, stay low salt, lots of veg, and lean meat. Carnivore is a way to go. Is it not hard to uh, hard to convince? I definitely think so. Obviously, you know, it's it's difficult when you're when you just had a major surgery like that and the and the doctor says do this exact opposite thing um, can be very difficult. Check out Dr. Philip Ovadia. He's a, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon that does bypass surgeries and he will tell you go high fat carnivore. The evidence is not there that, um, you know, that fat and cholesterol cause heart disease. In fact, the evidence is pointing to the opposite of that. Um, a recent study just came out saying that there's no association between saturated fat intake and, and cardiovascular disease. None. Um, and there's been more like that. There was a, a major paper out of the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2020 showing, looking at uh, doing a, a literature review, looking at the randomized control trials, the top levels of evidence, the meta analyses of randomized control trials, and so on. And they found zero association between increased saturated fat intake and the development of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. And they, in fact, they found an inverse relationship between saturated fat intake and stroke rates. So the more saturated fat people were eating, the less strokes they were having, the less saturated fat they were eating, the more strokes they were having. So this is protective. This is good for you. This is what we have been eating for millions and millions and millions of years. This is what all animals eat in the wild. They don't eat low fat. Carnivores eat animals that are made of fat and meat, fat and protein, right? And they generally go for the fat first, Herbivores eat fiber, the ones that eat fiber. I don't, God knows what the hell a, a metabolism of a hummingbird is, but the metabolism of a cow and a gorilla and a rhinoceros and an ox is such that they still run on fat and protein. Why is that? Because they can't break down fiber. No animal can break down fiber, not even termites. It's the microorganisms in their gut that eat the fiber. And as a waste product, they produce saturated fat. And then the bacteria or the protozoa die off and they get absorbed as protein. So gorillas may eat a bunch of green leaves, but what they absorb is fat and protein, usually about 
one to one grams of fat to protein. So 70% calories from fat, uh, 30% from protein. Same is true of rhinoceroses and ox. You know, have these game changer guys. They're like saying like, oh, look at an ox. You know, he just eats grass. Look how muscly he is. Yeah, idiot. That's because he can turn the grass into fat and protein. You can't. So you need that from your diet. Uh, or your steroids and a bunch of supplements and all, all the other crap you put in your body, which is not going to end well, sorry to say. And hopefully they they sort of, you know, come around before they do too much damage to their body. But, um, you know, take a look at those things. You know, take a look at the, you know, my video on the truth about cholesterol and heart disease is just not there. The evidence is just not there that this stuff causes harm. It was a scapegoat by the sugar companies to, you know, cast the blame away from sugar and uh and to say sugar is safe this is their words not mine their published documents said that they did this and who they paid off and how much they paid them so this is not conjecture this is not up for debate this is an historical fact as well oh, but no but shut up this is not up for debate this is a fact this was published this was their words they did this so this is just not, it's just not the case. And you have people, you know, who listen to this advice or, you know, the consumption data in America is very clear. You know, we've, we've been eating less fat, less red meat, lowering cholesterol through diet, lifestyle, fiber intake, and medications. We've been increasing fruits and vegetables, increasing heart healthy grains and heart healthy, heart healthy polyunsaturated fats and seed oils and linoleic acid and omega-6s and all that filth. And what happened? Well, heart disease rates have tripled for one and obesity rates have sextupled and so have diabetes rates and cancer rates have tripled and stroke rates have tripled. And, you know, all these things have gotten worse, not better, you know? So we lower red meat, we lower cholesterol, we lower fat, we, you know, increase um, fruits, vegetables, and polyunsaturated fats, which are all supposed to be good for the heart. And our heart conditions have gotten worse. And, you know, and, and the liars out there, you know, the Dr. Allos and the Simon Hills of the world will tell you that, well, in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, the, the mortality rate of cardiovascular disease peaked, and then it started coming down after that. That's not what we said. We said the rate of heart disease has gone up. The prevalence, the incidence, the amount of people, the percentage of the population that has cardiovascular disease is going up decade by decade in America and around the world. The incidence, the amount of people that get new diagnoses every year having first time heart attacks, but are surviving are going up in America and around the world decade after decade. And the death from cardiovascular disease around the world is going up and it's going up out of proportion with the growth in uh, the population. So it's just in America, the deaths sort of peaked and then sort of came down, but the rate has continued to go up. If this treated it, if this was the underlying cause was more meat, more fat, more cholesterol causes this and you reduce all that, the prevalence, the rate, the incidence should all go down. It doesn't. Our interventions have gotten better. Our ambulance systems have gotten better. We have private jets in Australia called the Royal, Royal Flying Doctors that fly out to BFE, picking up someone who's had a heart attack, 24 hour drive away from you know a major city where they can get a cath lab or some sort of major intervention and you fly them down, right? Hugely expensive, but you're saving people's lives, right? It's obviously abused you get you know peripheral hospitals that just want to turf someone and get them away from their hospital and they, they force them you know to come down and 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 you and you get there and you're like there's nothing wrong with this person you know um and then that costs twenty thousand dollars a leg so that's not good however you know it does save lives and so you're having a heart attack out in the middle of nowhere in the 70s yeah you you're dead <laughs> you're not gonna make it we have bypass surgery is improving. We have more cardiothoracic surgeons. We have more interventional cardiologists. We have different sorts of stenting and early detection and people stop smoking as much too. I mean, that's a major reduction uh, in mortality just there, which is going to, is going to come from uh, the reduction in smoking, but all these interventions have improved. And so people having their, their heart attack for the first time, but surviving is going up. So 
you know, you try these red herrings, these straw man arguments. Oh, but oh, no, 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 that's not the argument. And you damn well know it. And you're, you're, you're being purposefully misleading because you're a shill and a con and, um, or just too dumb to understand what statistics are. So, you know, don't let these people, uh, convince you into bad health. I mean, it's, it's just total bullshit. I mean, they're, they're doing this for their own purposes. They're either being paid to do this or they're just, they're, or they're, trying to, you know, build up some sort of reputation. I mean, I think some, you know, uh, some people just don't have better things to do. They don't have a real job. I don't know what Simon Hill does besides just talk a bunch of vegan nonsense, which he's completely insincere about. I mean, you see him talking about like, oh, I don't think I could live in a world without animals. Mm, animals. I'm like the, fa you know, clearly never took any acting classes because that was horrible, you know, but he's just pandering to these people that um you know that he that are, are paying his bills because he doesn't have a real job because the, all he does is, is do his you know podcast sell his book and try to try to you know go through different sorts of um you know self-aggrandizement so i mean you know that's ridiculous you know purposefully misleading people and purposefully changing the argument in order to knowingly mislead people and make them think that you know, that, that, that the mortality rate from cardiovascular disease going down, it has anything to do with the rates and the prevalences going down. And, and, you know, I mean, these people know this, I mean, this is, a, this is a common, common, common thing that they say, and, you know, they damn well know better. So this is on purpose, right? And so, you know, I mean, you have to ask them what their motivations are, but I mean, they're not good. You know, it's not good one way or the other to, to intentionally mislead people, to intentionally try to suggest that because the mortality rate has come down, that means the overall rate is coming down. That means these interventions are working. That means that the cholesterol lowering medications are working. That means that, you know, eating less meat is working because it's not. And they know it's not, which is why they aren't arguing prevalence incidents. They're arguing mortality rate. That's a different thing. And they know it's a different thing. And that's why I say they're dishonest. And that's why I have no time for these people because that's disgusting behavior. And, you know, and, and that, that truly makes me, me pissed off because they, they are hurting people. You know, their advice is hurting people and potentially killing them. And that pisses me off because they're not just doing it. It's not an honest mistake anymore. They are knowingly misleading people. They are knowingly trying to uh, spread misinformation by that. That pisses me off. And so sorry for the rant. I know this got went way past uh, where, I, where I met you on that. But in any case, there are, there is, there are just reams of evidence to show that, um, that the, the traditional recommendations on lowering fat, lowering cholesterol, lowering meat are complete and utter bullshit. And reams of, of very high level uh, studies and experiments and randomized control trials showing that actually saturated fat and meat is protective improvement. I mean, randomized controlled trials replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat to lower LDL cholesterol did indeed lower LDL cholesterol and more people died of heart attack and strokes as a result of that. And they've buried that study because they're dishonest bastards and they don't want to actually help people. They want to push their agenda. So screw them. Don't listen to, don't listen to all these other people. Do your own damn research. I mean, that's the thing. Who, who the hell has ever, you know, been on the right side of things when they say, don't do your own research, just be ignorant and listen to us, your masters and the unelected elites. And the, the, you know, like as Thomas Sowell says, you know, the self appoint, the self anointed, you know, they are just the chosen ones of their own choosing. And so don't listen to yourself. Don't actually do your own research. Don't read a book. Don't try to be educated. Only listen to us. Sounds like a great plan, you know? Um, never listen to anyone who says that, you know, you, you don't, you don't agree with my conclusions. Fine. I mean, I, I put the studies, you know, in these different, in these different descriptions, you go down, you know, and you look at them and you, you see for yourself, see if you're convinced by it. I certainly was. And I try to show, you know, the evidence that I base that on. Um, if you're not convinced, you're not convinced. That's, that's up to you. You know, I try to be transparent with these things. Um, if someone is telling you, oh, don't do your research. Oh, that's just ridiculous. You should listen to experts. You know, sorry, but you know, F experts, you need to be in control of your own life because no one else is going to care more than you if you get sick and die. You know, 
is, as Thomas Sowell says, it's a really bad idea to let people who pay no price, to people make decisions who pay no price for being wrong. You have these other people saying, oh, this is what you should do and you have to do and all these sorts of things. And if it's wrong, they're not the ones dying. They're not the ones getting heart disease. They're not the ones whose parents are, are you know, going in, you know, getting mentally feeble and enfeebled and, and going into nursing homes and having a horrible, horrible last several years of their lives or decades of their life and then dying early and in pain. You know, that is bullshit. They have no business doing that. It's you that are going to suffer. It's your parents that are going to suffer. It's your children that are going to suffer. So you need to take responsibility. You need to look at these things and you need to find out what is right for you to do. And then you experiment. A study can only tell you, it will only guide you and give you an idea of what is best for you to do. But then it's you who do it. You have to do it. You have to take the risk. And then you try it and you see and like, okay, yeah, this helps me. Great. Or you say, mm, I don't really believe that study. I'm going to do this other thing. And you have the exact opposite results of that study. Well, obviously that study wasn't applicable to you or it was a bad study or it was, you know, in, in, you know, um, you know, bad for other sorts of reasons, either <laughs> intentionally or unintentionally. Right. Either way, you know, it doesn't matter what a study says. It matters what happens to your, in your own life. Right. So if you're getting better and better and healthier and healthier and people say, you're going to die. You know, but there's evidence to suggest the exact opposite. And the most direct evidence is you're getting better. You know, why are you listening to those people? You know, and so, you know, do 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 your own research. Do educate yourself. You know, this is age old saying you keep people ignorant. You keep them under control. Don't be controllable. Be uncontrollable by these bastards that are trying to control you. Be a free thinking individual. Be educated as much as you can in every subject that you can. And the more able you are to do that, the more independent you are, the more fiercely independent and the more educated you are, the harder it is for them to control you and to take over your life. And it is your life. It is not their life. It is only yours. And so you deserve to live your own life. These bastards do not have a right to make your decisions for you and to control your life. Don't let them. So you need to be educated. You need to be healthy. And I think this is the best way to do it. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to end it there. I can just keep keep rambling forever. Um, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. Um, I do have another couple of lives uh, coming on. Um, um, and, uh, let me just take a look at those dates here very quickly. So I have, I have a couple coming up, which were maybe like two or three in the next couple of weeks. Um, I have, uh, yeah, carnival for kids. That's on the, the 27th. So that will be tomorrow. I have, um, uh, hanging with the Browns on the 29th. So that will be, was that Tuesday, Monday. That'll be Monday. Uh, yeah, Monday. And uh, these are these are Australian times, by the way. So obviously, you know, it may change depending on your time zone. And then another live next Wednesday morning in America and uh, eve ooh, no morning in Australia and Tuesday afternoon, evening in um, in America. So do check those out. And then please do come by for the premiere uh, with uh, my episode with Nick Norwitz um, talking about all things cholesterol, cardiovascular disease, and Oreo cookie. So uh, that will be uh, on Sunday in America, on Monday morning in Perth, times to be announced on my Instagram and YouTube channels. Thank you very much. Oh, and Facebook. Thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Um, hope you guys have a great weekend. And if people are in Perth, please do get to, ch please do check out the rugby because I probably won't be able to. And thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next week for the live and see you for the, the premiere um, Monday, Sunday. Thanks a lot. Take care.